Praise for New York Times and USA Today Best-selling author Diane Capri Full of thrills and tension but smart and human too. Kim Otto is a great, great character. I love her. Lee Child, number one New York Times best-selling author of Jack Reacher thrillers. A welcome surprise. W. Orcs from the first page to the end. Larry King. Swift pacing and ongoing suspense are always present. L.I. Cable protagonist, who uses her political connections for a good cause. Readers should eagerly anticipate the next book. Top pick, Romantic Times. Offers tense legal drama with courtroom overtones, twisty plot, and loads of Florida atmosphere. Recommended. Library Journal. A fast-paced legal thriller, energetic prose, an appealing heroine, clever and capable supporting cast, that will keep readers waiting for the next book. Publishers Weekly. Expertise shines on every page. Margaret Marin, Edgar Anthony, Agatha and McCavity award-winning MWA Grandmaster and past president. Readers love the Jordan Fox Mysteries series. Amazing. Wow, 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 Diane Capri really knocked this one out of the park. Tom T. Now that I have finished the series, I absolutely loved it. Lisa. A spellbinding thriller. Every page is full of action. John K. Great reading, a nice mixture of characters. Twists and turns on every page. Never a dull moment. Recommend reading all Diane Capri books. Joyce H. I have read the entire series and liked all of the books. Diane Capri gets my vote for one of my favorite authors. PJ. No one writes better than Diane. A tight plot, colorful characters, and a real page turner. Highly recommended. Alan D. Each book is better than the last. Evelyn G. Also by Diane Capri. Click each title to buy or download a sample. The Jordan Fox Mysteries. Cold Open, Book 1. Two Shot, Book 2. Jump Cut, Book 3. Beat Check, Book 4. Down Cut, Book 5. Sound Bit, Book 6. Hot Roll, Book 7. Hard News, Book 8. Sign Off, Book 9. The Hunt for Jack Reacher series. In publication order with Lee Child Source Books in parentheses. Don't Know Jack, Killing Floor. Jack in a Box, Novella. Jack and Kill, Novella. Get Back Jack, Bad Luck and Trouble. Jack in the Green, Novella. Jack and Joe, The Enemy. Deep Cover Jack, Persuader. Jack the Reaper, The Hard Way. Black Jack, Running Blind, The Visitor. 10 2 Jack, The Midnight Line. Jack of Spades, Past Tense. Prepper Jack, Die Trying. Full Metal Jack, The Affair. Jack Frost, 61 Hours. Jack of Hearts, Worth Dying For. Straight Jack, A Wanted Man. Jack Knife, Never Go Back. Lone Star Jack, Echo Burning. Bulletproof Jack, Make Me. Bet on Jack, Nothing to Lose. Jack on a Wire, Tripwire. Tracking Jack, Gone Tomorrow. The Hunt for Justice series. Do Justice. Twisted Justice. Secret Justice. Wasted Justice. Raw Justice. Mistaken Justice, Novella. Cold Justice, Novella. False Justice, Novella. Fair Justice, Novella. True Justice, Novella. Night Justice. The Jess Kimball Thriller series. Fatal Enemy, Novella. Fatal Distraction. Fatal Demand. Fatal Error. Fatal Fall. Fatal Edge, Novella. Fatal Game. Fatal Bond. Fatal Past, Novella. Fatal Dawn. Fatal Shot. The Air Hunter series. Blood Trails. Trace Evidence. Ground Truth. Hard Money. Cast of Primary Characters Jordan Fox, Nelson Fox, Brenda Fox, Claire Stone, 
Salvador Castor, Clayton Vaughn, Chester Flynn, Dominique Wren, Tom Clark, Terry Reiser, Russ Dallas, Drew Hodges, Linda Pierce, Richard Grady, Patricia Neal, Teresa Parma, Antonio Vega, Jenny Lane, Evan Groves, Aaron Robinson, Hugo Diaz, Mark Gifford, Alden Walker, Hot Roll, A Jordan Fox Mystery, by Diane Capri. Chapter 1 While he waited for the lawyer to call, the boss watched Pippo's execution again. Pippo's cell was the same as thousands of other jail cells. Furnished for two inmates, two cots rested parallel to each other on opposite walls. Between the cots, in the center of the back wall, one stainless steel toilet protruded. Next to the toilet was a stainless steel sink. High above the sink, a rectangular window recessed into cement block walls thicker than standard eight inches. Sturdy bars, well anchored into the dense blocks, crossed the window. Weak light filtered through from outdoors, suggesting the 7.05 p.m. time stamped on the video was accurate for October in Tampa. Pippo lay on his back, greasy hair strewn on the pillow, thick forearm over his eyes, wide stocking feet protruding from the tent-sized orange jumpsuit. His ample chest rose and fell with even breathing. The boss shook his head slowly. Poor tragic rabbit. Pippo had always been a good man. A follower, not a leader. But a loyal follower, and loyalty was hard to come by. The Judas entered Pippo's cell using a key the lawyer had provided. Pippo didn't stir. The drugs had worked well to sedate him, which was efficient. Less resistance. Less noise. He might have been asleep. His guards probably thought so, if they considered the matter at all, which they'd been paid well not to do. He crossed the short distance to Pippo's cot. He leaned in. He might have spoken a few words, but if he did, they were not audible on the video. Pippo remained still. He sat on the empty cot across the cell, pulled his long socks off. He wrapped one end of each sock around his hand and snapped the garrote taut. He slipped his bare feet into his shoes. His hands were steady. He slipped the garrote around Pippo's fleshy neck and pulled until the veins on his muscled forearms bulged with the effort and held it tight to crush Pippo's windpipe and terminate breathing. When Pippo's chest stopped expanding, he removed Pippo's socks and placed them on the cot. He tied his own long socks together securely and fashioned the noose. He tied the loose end of the sock rope to the bars on the window. He tugged on the knots, tightening them. He strained to lift Pippo's heavy body. Propped Pippo against the sink, slipped on the noose and snugged it close. He lifted Pippo's body and stretched the noose taut before he suspended Pippo from the window bars and down the side of the sink. He stood back to examine the scene. Everything was as it should have been. Pippo was heavy. The sock rope might not have held long enough to kill. But Pippo was already dead, so no problem if the body fell to the floor too soon. Then he looked around one last time, grabbed Pippo's socks, left through the cell door and locked it behind him. He walked three cells down the row and pulled another cell door open. He entered, reached through to lock himself in, and handed the key to the lawyer. He sat on the edge of his cot, removed his shoes, slipped Pippo's socks onto his feet and donned shoes once more. He lay on his back in the same position as he'd found Pippo. Cold bastard. Always had been. The video stopped. The boss replayed it again. He tapped his forefinger on the table like a metronome as he watched, marking time. The killer had done well with Pippo. And with the Dia agent. Unfortunately, he had also failed. He'd failed to stop the reporter, which was why Pippo was now dead and the killer would soon follow. But he was assigned to silence one more tragic rabbit first. Groves. Hapless, hopeless, unlucky Groves. A curious sidekick for the killer, but they'd arrived at El Pulpo together and remained loyal to each other, in their fashion. Perhaps they'd find it appropriate to terminate together as well. The boss watched the video twice more before the cell phone rang. Only the lawyer knew this number.
The call was routed through servers on three continents before it reached the boss. After this one call, too short to trace, he would destroy the phone. He'd been El Pulpo's boss longer than any other boss before him, only because he was a careful man. Yes, the boss said. Termination confirmed. The lawyer never wasted words. Yes, the boss said again. The boss expected the lawyer to terminate the call, but the lawyer stayed on the line. Yes. The sickness is not contained. The lawyer's tone was grim but firm. Not shocking. The boss expected something to go wrong with every plan. He was rarely disappointed. Yes. One death. Five in quarantine. The boss's finger tapped while he considered the data. Proceed as planned. Of course. The lawyer took a breath. And the cleaner. Another project, another problem. Situation normal. Yes. He's kept one. Again. The lawyer hesitated half a beat. The reporter's on it. The boss frowned and wiped his palm over his face. The reporter. Again. Jordan Fox had disrupted El Pulpo's plans repeatedly over the past few weeks. Her interference had destroyed his product, pushed his team off course, and left him shorthanded for the critical final stages. He'd planned to deploy the contaminated water later. But the timing wasn't critical. The threat was credible, and the ransom would be paid. He'd simply collect the ransom money sooner than expected. After that, El Pulpo's Tampa operation would be offline until replacements were installed. Jordan Fox was responsible for the lost personnel and lost revenue. Why couldn't the kid just give up? He'd allowed her several opportunities, but she hadn't taken them. She was too young to be so stubborn. The boss shrugged. So be it. He nodded, his decision made. Jordan Fox had interfered with El Pulpo's operations for the last time. He gave the order. And Fox? Him? Or her? The lawyer asked. Both. Tragic rabbits. Another half a beat passed before the lawyer said, understood. The boss waited until he heard the lawyer disconnect before he terminated the connection on his end. He pulled the phone apart and removed its battery. He dropped the phone on the ground and smashed it with the heel of his boot. He bent to collect the pieces. He dropped pieces into four trash cans along the streets of the city as he made his way to the helipad for the short flight to Tampa. Chapter 2 What a great hideout this place is. Jordan Fox leaned out the driver's window of her car and surrendered her driver's license to the armed guard at the entrance to Hills Bay Estates. She looked directly at the camera while it snapped her headshot. She pressed her right thumbprint onto the electronic pad. He studied everything while she tapped her left foot impatiently. The guard's name tag said SGT. Irwin. From the look of him, he'd probably been military police once upon a time. Adrenaline flowed through from her toes to her scalp. Minutes ago, she'd escaped from the worst house arrest ever. No television, no newspapers, no internet, no calls from work or Tampa PD or even the FBI. For an entire week. Sure, they were all worried about her after her kidnapping and near meltdown on the air afterward. But seriously? That kind of isolation was pure torture for a news junkie like Jordan. She felt a level of tingling joy she could only describe as thrilled to break free of her home, even if she'd only traveled two miles. This place was beautiful. She was excited to get back to work at Channel 12. And to get on with everything she had to accomplish before her shift started at 2.30 p.m. too. Come on. Let's go. Obviously, I'm not a burglar. You checked my ID. Her impatience didn't speed SGT. Irwin along at all. An eternity later, he nodded and placed a temporary sticker on her window. The sticker had a barcode on it. Then he used an electronic wand to read the barcode. Finally, he opened the gate and waved her through. Geez. Talk about being locked in a gilded cage. She shrugged. At least her dad and everyone else she knew 
couldn't watch her like a hawk every minute while she was here. Before SGT, Erwin had a chance to change his mind. She smiled and waved through the open window, and eased past the gate as if the nearly TSA-worthy procedures were completely normal in her everyday world. Jordan lived in a comfortable but modest house on a quiet residential street in South Tampa with her dad. The only guards were the neighborhood dogs. The only gates were the flower pots at the end of their driveway. Maybe she was a little crazy by now, but that entire security process back there made her feel safer and sillier at the same time. She admired the lush tropical landscape. We're going to love it here, aren't we, Hermes? She asked her electric blue Honda. Hermes said nothing. She glanced into the back seat. Everything was still there. Everything she'd need to make real progress on solving her mother's murder. Finally, five years later, she was away from her dad's watchful eye and constant disapproval of that goal. She'd apply laser focus to her mission. By the end of this week, she'd be light years ahead. She could feel it. Make it so. Jordan followed directions, traveling along the luxurious residential streets, until she found 1486 Poinciana Way discreetly painted on the curb. Oh man. This is the life. Jordan steered Hermes to the right and parked in the circular tumbled stone driveway in front of the mansion. Water flowing through the courtyard fountain bubbled and splashed to greet her with good cheer. Work hard for the next twenty years, Jordan Fox, and something like this baby could be yours. She giggled like a six-year-old. She felt her very bones relaxing for the first time since she'd been kidnapped by the El Pulpo cartel and rescued by Tampa PD nine days ago. Yep. How sitting in a ginormous mansion. Way better. For sure. This particular mansion belonged to Linda Pierce, Channel 12 Assistant News Director. Linda and her husband had left early that morning for a vacation. For the next week, Jordan would be the master of all she surveyed. Freaking amazing. Jordan shook her head. Life is weird. House sitting for the woman who hired Jordan as a multimedia journalist, or MMJ at Channel 12, then demoted her to intern on her first day? She hadn't seen that one coming. To be fair, the demotion was nothing personal. Budget cuts, of course. Same story everywhere, in journalism. Jordan was lucky to have a job at all, and she knew it. She shrugged. If house sitting gets me the next promotion, I'd live in a two room shack. Drew Hodges would have jumped at the chance too. For once something good came to Jordan first. Drew was probably jealous. Yes. Jordan stretched like a cat in the sunlight. A Cheshire cat maybe, since she couldn't stop grinning. She pulled her phone out of her pocket and called her best friend, Claire. This place is freaking unbelievable. Jordan inhaled a big lungful of sweet jasmine-scented air and strolled around the grounds. Lush green grass extended 25 yards or so on either side of the driveway before the neighboring properties began. Are you sure you don't want to come stay with me this week? We could hang out at the pool, get a tan, eat pizza every night. This place beats your apartment by a landslide. Claire was quiet on the other end of the line. Maybe she was reconsidering. Maybe she would come back from her parents' home in Fort. Lauderdale to spend the week with Jordan, after all. A girlfriend week sounded perfect. Linda Pierce would be okay with Claire staying here. She'd said she wanted Jordan protected from El Pulpo, which was a bit melodramatic. No one had tried to hurt Jordan in at least a week. Another giggle bubbled up at the foolish thought. Claire said, you're not getting hysterical, are you? Stop worrying. I'm just glad to have a little space and fresh air. That whole kidnapping thing seemed surreal by now, actually. Her kidnappers were arrested, her bruises had faded, and she felt perfectly normal. Why couldn't everyone see that? I love my dad, but he's been a smothering hen since he found out what happened. He's not wrong. Claire's voice was quiet, pensive. These people are dangerous, Jordan. You know that. So you're really not coming over here, then? Since Salvador Castor agreed to testify against El Pulpo and disappeared into witness protection instead of going to prison, Claire had acted like a war widow. Talk about melodramatic. 
Claire had only dated the guy for four months, after all. He must have been great in bed. Jordan giggled again. Maybe she was hysterical. She wished Claire would snap out of it, but she didn't push. Fun-loving Claire could be as stubborn as any two-year-old. Sal is gone. I've got to make a plan for my life. Claire sighed like a weary old nun. And right now, Fort. Lauderdale is the perfect place for me to do that. Well, I'm here for a week. The place is amazing. Hit me up if you change your mind. Jordan squared her shoulders and rang off. Maybe Claire needed the time. Maybe she'd be her normal self by the time she came back. Other options? Jordan could invite her new man crush Tom Clark over to watch a sunset with her. Too romantic? Probably too romantic, too soon. They'd yet to even go on a real one-on-one -on -one date. But they'd talked on the phone a lot during the worst house arrest ever. He didn't know her story, and she wanted to keep it that way for a while. That was one of the reasons she liked him. A fresh start. She'd managed to keep her name out of the news, and so far, had remained unidentified as a kidnapping victim. Not that it really mattered. El Pulpo, the crime cartel everybody was so keen to protect her from, already knew. Everyone at Channel 12 knew. Hell, everyone in law enforcement for miles around knew too. Even her dad knew. And all of them had ganged up on her. They made her get a full medical examination and refused to let her work for a week. And now Drew Hodges was winning their job competition too, according to regular reports from her friend Teresa. Which royally sucked. The whole thing was so unfair. She didn't ask to be kidnapped. She felt her chest fill and her nostrils flare and her blood pounding in her ears. Chill, Jordan. That was last week. You're in paradise now. You go in early, talk to Richard, and then you're back to work. She snapped her fingers and the foolish grin popped onto her face once more. El Pulpo wouldn't find her here at the Pierce's. This place was closed up tighter than Fort Knox. She was safe here. Her dad had a Tampa PD detail on his house. An FBI agent Ricer said she'd check on him regularly, too. Everything was fine. Don't borrow trouble, Jordan said, just as her mom used to say. The minute the words were out of her mouth, goose flesh raised along her limbs. Jordan shook off the creepy feeling and hustled down the stone path that ran along the side of the house to the fence Linda had told her to open. She found the key under the rock by the hot tub. Wow. Beyond the pool, a big canal funneled into the open water of Tampa Bay. She shivered when she saw the water's edge was not fenced. By boat they could easily approach, dock, get onto the grounds and into the house. She felt sure her mother's killers had approached and escaped her home by boat, although the police had never proved that. El Pulpo was active in drug smuggling by boat, which was how Claire's boyfriend got jammed up. El Pulpo could avoid the armed guards if they entered from the open water. Jordan. Knock it off. Okay. Okay. For a few more seconds, she gazed across the empty blue expanse of tranquility, but then she squared her shoulders and returned to the car for her bags. Chapter 3 Jordan unlocked the back door and moved the first batch of stuff inside, a computer bag, a medium-sized yellow duffel, and the sling bag that was practically glued to her body. The heavy door opened to the deep, woodsy smell of expensive imported furniture. Afternoon sunlight reflected off granite countertops and spotless floors. Plenty of room to spread out. Her house-sitting duties were simple. Bring in the newspapers and the mail, Make sure the outdoor lights were on at night, give the cat a scoop of food every day, let the house cleaners in, and wait for them to finish cleaning. Jordan didn't need a cleaning service. But Linda had insisted, and this was her house. When the boss talks, Jordan Fox listens. Well, sometimes anyway. Besides, it was no hardship to hang around this beautiful house for a few hours in the morning. She trotted out to Hermes and collected everything from the back seat. She carried two heavy boxes of stuff she planned to use to solve Mother's murder into the house and set them on the dining table. These boxes contained everything she'd accumulated so far. Surely she'd find some answers here. 
or at least, a few good leads she could follow up. In these boxes? Not much, actually. There had to be a lot more evidence somewhere. Police files for sure. Channel 12 archives, definitely. Maybe a few others. But she didn't have access to any of that. Yet. She had a few hours before she was due to report to work. And she was stuck here until after the cleaning crew left. She plugged her mother's external hard drive into her laptop and heard a loud hum as everything started up. So far, so good. The hard drive's still not damaged. She really should stop talking to herself. But she thought better out loud. Always had. Only child syndrome, maybe. She placed her phone on the table and remembered something else she wanted to do before breaking into her mother's private history. Okay, you're just procrastinating now. Admit it. Jordan shrugged. Her mother had set up the security system to allow only five tries every 24 hours. The last thing Jordan wanted to do was to make five failed attempts every day like she'd been doing for weeks now. She had to be strategic about this. Think like her mom. But how? Brenda Fox wasn't the kind of woman who led a secret life or anything. Jordan figured she used the password to keep Jordan and her friends from accidentally finding private student counseling information. Whatever was on the hard drive seemed somehow more important because of the security system. Or maybe it's nothing more mysterious than old financial records. Ever think about that? Okay, Jordan. That's enough fooling around. Get to work. Carpe diem. Seize the day. I get it. She talked back to herself again, but damn it was quiet around here. Carpe diem. Her mother used to say that to her all the time. She typed the letters carefully without spaces into the hard drive software entry screen on her laptop. Red X crap. She settled into an armchair near the table to flip through her mother's yearbooks for ideas. She reached for Riverside Middle School Footsteps 2006 because it was on the top of the pile. A screech of brakes and a slamming door outside stopped her just as she opened up the hardback cover. She closed the book. I. I'm coming, Mom. Hang on. Jordan walked to the front of the house and peered out the window. A white van parked in the driveway proclaimed lemony fresh cleaning. She checked her watch. 9.55 a.m. An hour early. Crap. Chapter 4 Jordan watched through the window as a skinny guy with a goatee and hairy legs sticking out below khaki cargo shorts yanked open the front passenger door. He pulled the woman in the front seat by the wrist, and she practically tumbled out. Skinny guy put one hand on her waist and one hand on her shoulder, correcting her posture, and then smoothed her pleated navy skirt, running his hands roughly, intimately, down the sides in the front. Dude, I think she can do that herself, Jordan said, as if he could hear through the walls. She shivered. This guy already gave her the creeps. He closed the door and the woman stood stiff, silent, waiting, while the driver opened the back door, yanked a second woman out by her wrists too. He straightened the front of her crisp white blouse. When he moved to smooth her skirt, Jordan reached for the doorknob to intervene. She stopped. Maybe this is normal. And this isn't my house. I'm not their client. Linda is. I should stay out of this. The second woman looked like a teenaged girl. Thin, slight, chin down as if hiding her face behind a curtain of brown hair. He said something to her, and she reached into her pocket, pulled out a gray ribbon and tied her hair back neatly. Jordan watched the driver point at the women like a conductor. Fake smiles slashed across their faces in quick response. He then picked up two buckets of supplies and motioned toward the front door. The women marched ahead, eyes downcast. He followed, mouth slightly open, revealing a crooked row of teeth that could have used a good whitening with industrial strength bleach. Jordan felt her stomach revolt. What a disgusting creature. Touch me, buddy, and I'll knock you into next week. She looked around quickly and spotted a heavy pair of candlesticks that would make good clubs if need be. She stepped back so they wouldn't see she'd been watching. Each woman wore the same uniform. The one from the front seat was taller and maybe a bit older. 
The closer they came, the younger they looked. They were girls. Young. Eighteen tops. They marched up to the front porch, and he rang the bell. Lemony fresh cleaning at your service. The girls spoke in unison when Jordan opened the door, wide smiles in place. Jordan forced a friendly tone into her voice. Yes, welcome. I thought you weren't due till eleven. The man put one hand each girl's shoulder. We're running ahead of schedule today. He tilted his head and leaned forward as he spoke. His foul breath nearly knocked Jordan over. I hope it's no inconvenience. She moved back, shook her head rapidly, and tried not to inhale. No problem at all. He gave each girl a little push in the center of their spines, and they stepped into the foyer. I'll be back at five, girls, he sing-songed before he turned and sauntered back toward his van, whistling and destroying every air particle in his path. She closed the door behind him and locked it. How did these girls put up with him? The shorter girl bowed slightly. I'm Maria. And I'm Edith. The taller girl's voice was raspy. She didn't bow. She scowled and stared over Jordan's shoulder, avoiding eye contact like the annoyed teenager she surely was. I'm Jordan. You've been here before. Yeah. Edith gazed down the hall, still avoiding eye contact. I haven't. Maria seemed especially nervous. She shifted her weight from one foot to the other. She shook her head and her voice trembled. Thank you for allowing that Esme clean your house. Jordan detected a Mexican accent, or maybe it was Dominican? She was normally good with accents, but she couldn't pinpoint the region. Not yet, anyway. She stepped aside. Well, Edith, you probably know your way around. You'll show Maria? Let me know if there's anything you need. They nodded and set to work with their buckets of cleaning supplies. Maria shuffled into the kitchen while Edith clomped upstairs. Jordan's phone rang. She patted her pockets. Not there. It rang again. Right. She'd left it by the computer. She hurried to grab it and noticed the caller ID flashing on the screen. Clayton. She was afraid she'd given him the wrong idea when she called him not ugly last week. She was just being friendly, but he must have thought she'd been flirting because he kept calling on one pretext or another. Or maybe you shouldn't have spontaneously kissed him when he saved your ass by finding your phone and returning it, huh? She scowled and answered his call. Carefully. What's up? I've got to talk with you. His tone was urgent. I have news on the Evan Groves Ruby Quinn murder case. A flush of adrenaline ripped through her body. She placed a hand on the glass tabletop and gazed out the back window, blinking rapidly. What? Is it big news? Has he confessed? Slightly breathless, she pulled out her notepad and uncapped her pen with her teeth. I want to tell you in person. Clayton used his slow, deep voice. The voice that meant he was sure Jordan would be impressed with his work. He was usually right. Crap. Jordan rubbed her eyes. She couldn't date Clayton, no matter how sexy he was. Not now. Or ever. Any personal relationship between a journalist and a police officer was a conflict of interest waiting to happen, not to mention drama overload. Also, not to mention today would be her first day back at work. Clayton's timing couldn't have been worse. How could she finesse this? Yes, of course. Jordan walked out onto the back patio. She wanted to hear his news, but she wouldn't grovel to get information from him or anybody else. Would you be able to come to Channel 12 this afternoon? I'd like Drew Hodges to hear it too. Whoa. Where did that come from? Since when was she letting Drew Hodges in on her private info sessions with the Tampa Police Department? Some kind of strange intuition had kicked in. Drew would be a barrier against Clayton's flirting, sure. But bringing Drew into the loop? That she didn't want. Did she? Definitely not. Still, her intuition said she'd made the right choice here. Go with it. Is there a place we can meet privately? Clayton asked. Three o'clock at Channel 12. All right. See you then. He clicked off. 
Maybe he sounded a little miffed. She wasn't sure. The timing was a gamble. Richard Grady, the news director, had called her in early for a talk before her shift. Then, the afternoon meeting would probably be over by three. She should be able to slip into a conference with Clayton and Drew before going out on assignment. If she was lucky. Of course, she'd also need to persuade Drew to participate. One thing at a time, Jordan. Chapter 5 The conversation with Clayton reminded Jordan to handle another task before she returned to working on her mom's hard drive. The pictures on her work phone were backed up to Skyspace automatically, but she felt more secure knowing the pictures existed somewhere besides an abstract cloud. She plugged her phone into her laptop and started the transfer. Photos copied. Delete photos from original device. Jordan's finger hovered over the yes button. Then a picture of Claire's bubblegum pink car filled her screen. Jordan had snapped the photo the night she'd met Tom Clark, the cute infidel brewery owner she liked all of a sudden more than she wanted to. The first guy she'd wanted to date since the big breakup with her fiancé at college graduation. Keep your eyes on the prize, Jordan. She didn't have time for men. She had to get hired full-time at Channel 12. And she had to solve her mother's murder. And she wanted justice for Ruby Quinn. Jordan was young. Plenty of years left for dating. Tom could wait. But would he? If he doesn't, then he's not as perfect as you think he is. She enlarged the photo she'd made in the dark parking lot the night she'd met Tom. The same night you first crossed Hugo Diaz. Not smart, Jordan. She frowned and her breath came a little faster. That was before Hugo and his crew had kidnapped her. She hadn't known Hugo's name that first night, and he hadn't known hers either. Nor could she prove Hugo was the one who had keyed Claire's car with the deep swirly gouges in the pink paint. The gouges that seemed familiar and at the same time unfamiliar. An involuntary shiver passed from her scalp to her toes. She couldn't prove it, but she knew Hugo had done the damage. Knew it. Jordan deleted all pictures from her camera except that one. The photo had been copied to her laptop and to Skyspace already. She kept the original on her camera. Just in case. In case of what, exactly? She shrugged. She couldn't answer her own question. But the uneasy feeling lingered, and it was related to Hugo. Hugo and his pal, Pippo, had been arrested and remained in custody. A good first step, but not good enough, even if police and prosecutors could manage to hold him there. FBI Special Agent Terry Reiser had told her that Hugo Diaz was not his real name. Preliminary searches to identify him had failed. He didn't exist in any U.S. databases. We'll find out who he is, Jordan. Don't worry. Agent Reiser had said. It's just a matter of time. I believe you, Jordan had replied. And she did. But this means Hugo Diaz is more dangerous than we thought, doesn't it? A man with no recorded history in this era of constant government surveillance was a man to be feared. Jordan knew that much. At the very least, it means he has powerful connections. Agent Reiser's next words were bone-chilling. Until we get his identity settled, is there somewhere you can go? Make it harder for Diaz and El Pulpo to find you? That was when Jordan accepted Linda Pierce's house-sitting job. Second item on Jordan's list, identify Hugo Diaz so she could go home at the end of the week. She knew where to start. El Pulpo, of course. And the man who called himself Evan Groves now. Jordan's news nose said it was no coincidence that they had the same slick lawyer. The lawyer who showed up at the jail even before Hugo Diaz arrived in the arresting officer's squad car. Let's try this again, Jordan said as she returned to the armchair and opened the yearbook. Chapter 6 Running water and a muffled vacuum cleaner motor established that one of the girls was working downstairs nearby. Jordan flipped through the first few pages of her mom's 2006 yearbook, but her mind wasn't processing. How long would they be there cleaning, anyway? She thumbed through the yearbook's pages until she landed on the middle school soccer team page. 
She scanned the list of names under the photo. Aaron Robinson. He'd been on the team. Made sense. Her mind wandered from point to point like a butterfly landing on flowers in a garden. College-level sports teams and sometimes staff were filled by a funnel from high schools, which were funneled up from middle schools. Aaron Robinson attended Riverside Middle School until 2006. He was tried and convicted in a vehicular homicide. Brenda Fox testified at the trial. He was sentenced as a minor. Released at age 18. At which point he simply disappeared. How did that happen? After that, somehow, he became Evan Groves and then Plant University assistant soccer coach. Jordan couldn't fathom how he ever got hired with his criminal history. And he was dealing drugs there, too, according to police. At least, until he was arrested in connection with Ruby Quinn's murder. Now, he was in jail and Jordan wanted him sent to prison. Forever. In fact, as far as she was concerned, prison was too good for him. She really hoped that was the news Clayton planned to deliver this afternoon. She scanned the yearbook's facing page of candid soccer player shots. Only one photo of Aaron Robinson. This time he'd been snapped with his arm wrapped around another boy's shoulder, identified as Mark Gifford. Jordan's upper lip curled. Aaron Robinson didn't look like a killer. He looked well normal. Other boys like this Mark Gifford kid seemed to act natural enough with him too. Then, something about the Mark Gifford boy held her attention. The darkness in his eyes. The confidence he exuded, even wearing torn sneakers, faded jeans, and an old t-shirt. What was that logo on the front of his t-shirt? The photo was in black and white, and Mark Gifford's t-shirt was dark and as wrinkled as wadded paper. Not a great combo for picture clarity. She couldn't make out the words. Jordan took a quick snapshot of the photo on her phone and enhanced it. Surprise caught her breath. Hell no. Is that even possible? Can't be. Both of her legs began to bounce. She barely noticed. She enhanced the photo again until the words were as crystal clear as screen printed cotton could be. Mark Gifford's t shirt was advertising something, all right. It was two words bold font. Two familiar words. Tragic Rabbit. She opened the magnifying glass app on her phone and examined the original photo closely, this time paying more attention to the boy than his clothes. He was already tall and well-built even back then. Boyhood immaturity predicted features that would develop into the handsome man she'd already spent way too much time with. Unlike the yearbook photos of Evan Aaron, which made him look like a choir boy, this photo revealed exactly what Mark Gifford would become. A cunning predator. Anybody could have seen it if they'd known to look for it. Jordan's mind went numb and she rocked back and forth. Tragic Rabbit. The untraceable email address that the FBI said El Pulpo used to collect ransom money was Tragic Rabbit. The untraceable email address that the reporter said had been used to buy one of the knives that killed Brenda Fox five years ago was also Tragic Rabbit. What the hell did Tragic Rabbit mean? A full second later, the impact slammed into her mind. Her body hummed along every nerve. Both legs bounced as if she was standing on a vibrating platform. She felt the bile rising in her throat and her stomach churning like a blender. She closed the yearbook and stood, pacing the room, fast. As if she might outrun the reality chasing her. Breathless, she stopped. Raked both hands through her hair and tried to slow her heartbeat. When she found her voice, she shouted, You have got to be freaking kidding me. A sharp cry from the kitchen doorway jerked her attention. Chapter 7 Maria The Young Cleaner Staring from the kitchen, poised to bolt, hands covering her mouth, face pinched as if she might scream again. Sorry. Sorry, Maria. Really? I was talking to myself, not to you. Jordan hadn't noticed the dark circles under Maria's eyes before. Poor kid looked exhausted, and they'd barely started cleaning. She'd be dead on her feet before they finished. All of that, and now she must be thinking Jordan was an irrational lunatic, too. Jordan smiled weakly and waved her hand. I'm just stressed out about work. 
She sat down again and picked up the yearbook simply to reassure the girl. Maria nodded slightly. After a few moments when Jordan did nothing else alarming, Maria lowered her head and returned to her work, glancing back over her shoulder frequently just in case. Jordan stared blankly toward the kitchen because the tragic rabbit connection was still too raw. She didn't want to figure it out just yet. She'd need to be alone for that. To work things through. In her own way. So she watched, eyes straight ahead, concentrating on nothing at all, almost zoned out. Maria wiped down the counters with all-purpose cleaning spray. After that, Maria spritzed the same spray on one of the huge kitchen windows. She smeared the oily goop around on the window. Maria whimpered as she tried to remove the greasy marks by spraying more. The harder she rubbed and the more she sprayed, the worse the window and her whimpering became. Jordan put down the yearbook and took a few steps toward the girl before her increasing agitation ended in tears or shattered glass. Maria? Maria jumped and turned to look behind her. Do you need window cleaner? Jordan walked carefully into the kitchen to face Maria's vacant stare. Jordan pointed to the messy window and then to the spray bottle. Glass cleaner? Maria's empty gaze coupled now with cowering shivers. What was wrong with the girl? After a moment, Maria struggled to answer the simple question. A stiff smile appeared and faltered. I'm sorry. This is the first week for me. I'm still learning. Her voice was trembling and almost inaudible. All of a sudden, Jordan felt like a big sister to the bafflingly terrified girl. Is this your first job? Maria didn't answer. She didn't stop cowering either. Jordan reached out to touch her arm. Is something wrong? Maria jerked her arm back as if she'd been branded by Jordan's touch. No. No. I keep working. She rushed to swipe counters she'd already cleaned and knocked over a vase. It tumbled off the counter and bounced twice on the hardwood floor, spilling flowers and water everywhere. Maria crouched down, ducked her head and covered her face, and shook as if she expected Jordan to strike her. It's okay, it's okay. Jordan picked up the vase. It's just water and flowers. The girl continued to tremble. She refused to meet Jordan's gaze. Come on, Maria. The vase didn't even break. You're probably just nervous because it's your first week. It's her second week. Jordan turned toward the grating voice. Edith stood with her hands on her hips, staring down at Maria, frowning fiercely. She's stupid, that's all. I try to help her, but no more now. Jordan stepped to block Edith's withering stare before Maria turned into a puddle of woe right on the kitchen floor. No more. No. Edith gave her head a quick dismissive shake before she swished her ponytail and stalked off. Maria sat with her head in her hands, legs fully extended. I should be better after two weeks. For the first time, Jordan noticed thick dark bruises encircled Maria's wrists and ankles. Had someone been abusing her? Edith seemed like the type to lash out when no one was watching. That creepy Felix looked like a man with a short fuse, too. Gently, Jordan asked, do you like the work? Maria nodded without looking up. Felix says he wants me to work the ship someday. Sounds exciting. Jordan leaned against the counter and angled her head. Felix is your supervisor? The man who dropped you off? Maria nodded again, still hiding her face. But I don't want to leave so quickly from my parents. Already, I moved away from home with them. I don't want different job. I want this job. I love cleaning house. I like the work every day. Jordan's news nose began to twitch. Something wasn't right here. She pulled a couple of tissues from a box beside the sink and handed them to Maria. And you're getting a paycheck, which I'm sure comes in handy. Maria sat up straight, finally. She hid a smile behind her hand. Yes, it is wonderful. Mr. Felix pays our rent and provides our meals, so 20% of the money we earn, we get to keep. Childlike naivete radiated from her face, along with the joy of collecting slave wages from the creepy Felix. Jordan scowled. How did he get away with that? What right did he have to take Maria's paycheck? 
Linda Pierce would not employ a cleaning service that allowed such behavior. Not a chance. But Jordan aimed to reassure Maria, not make matters worse. Hang in there. I love my job too. There are rough days. She chuckled. That was an understatement. But it gets better, I promise. I hope. Jordan heard footsteps behind her and turned in time to see Edith glaring at Maria again. I'll tell Felix if you don't work. Without another sniffle, Maria scampered up off the floor and applied the glass cleaner to the window with gusto. Jordan watched her a moment more. Something was definitely odd about Maria and this whole setup. Jordan would fill Linda in on everything as soon as she returned from her vacation. But today, Jordan had her own problems to handle. Chapter 8 When Maria moved on to another part of the mansion, Jordan could finally focus her attention on the yearbook and her efforts to break the code on her mother's external hard drive. An explanation for Tragic Rabbit was the top item on Jordan's radar, but she didn't want to research Tragic Rabbit with the cleaners in the house. She wanted them to go. She wanted complete silence and no prying eyes when she found out how, not if, El Pulpo was connected to her mother's murder. She flipped through the yearbook for inspiration. She landed on a page more worn than the rest because she and her dad had looked at it so many times. The center of the page was a picture of her mother in her office. Jordan squinted and noticed something in the picture she'd forgotten about. There was a stuffed bunny on her mom's desk in the picture. Could that be Tragic Rabbit? How weird would it be if her password was Tragic Rabbit? A chill raced down Jordan's spine. Why not? She tried dumber options. She typed Tragic Rabbit into the password box and squeezed her eyes closed as she pressed enter. Red X. It was a no-go. Something close to relief flooded Jordan's tense muscles. Whatever Tragic Rabbit meant, at least her mom wasn't tied to it. Maybe. Jordan heard footsteps coming down the stairs. Edith led the way, and Maria followed close behind. Felix is on the way for us, Edith said as she walked past Jordan and swished her ponytail again. Maria. Come. We'll wait outside. Maria stopped briefly to smile at Jordan. Thank you for being kind to me. Oh, not at all, Jordan replied. The poor girl looked dead on her feet. Deep shadows beneath her eyes gave her a wraith-like vibe. She needed a good meal and about a week of bed rest. You take good care of yourself, okay? Maria? Edith scolded like a fishwife. Maria nodded in response to Jordan's question. Then she shrugged and lowered her gaze and shuffled behind Edith out to the driveway. Jordan watched through the window as the van pulled up with Felix behind the wheel. Jordan snapped a few photos of Edith, Maria, Felix, and the van with her phone. Habit, she said, now that she could talk aloud again without being overheard. Maybe she would pitch a sexual harassment story in the afternoon meeting next week. This guy could be the poster boy for a lawsuit waiting to happen. I wish Maria could get a better job. Both girls stowed their buckets in the back and climbed in and Felix drove away. Jordan watched the van until it disappeared around the first corner. You should call the gate and ask the guard to make sure Felix actually leaves. She lifted up her phone and began to dial before she punched the clear button. Knock it off, Jordan. Linda's cleaning service is none of your business. You've got plenty to handle already. Richard's waiting. Get a move on. Chapter 9 Jordan parked Hermes in the Channel 12 garage and hurried toward the newsroom. She was excited to be back. Her pulse raced right along with her quick footsteps, and she covered the distance in record time. She didn't bother with the elevator, but dashed up the stairs. She stopped at the entrance for a moment. The open newsroom seemed as chaotic as ever. Light poured in from the floor-to-ceiling windows overlooking the Hills River. The assignment desk held the same prominent place right in the center of everything. Phones rang constantly, producers typed furiously on keyboards at their desks, and people moved through the spaces with purpose. Jordan inhaled deeply. The place actually smelled like pure excitement. So good to be back. Don't screw it up. 
Richard waited for her in his glass-walled office, seated in his black leather chair behind his big desk. The oversized digital newsroom clock read 1.55 p.m., five minutes early for their meeting. Plenty of time to spare. She waved to Teresa, who was dashing off to somewhere, laden with her usual three or four bags of various shapes. A couple of producers smiled at her when she passed them on her way to Richard's office. She knocked lightly on the doorframe. He glanced toward her and held up an index finger. He was on the phone. She stepped back into the corridor to wait. Three minutes later, Richard finished his call and looked up. Jordan, come on in and close the door. A sense of foreboding coursed through her and her stomach twisted. A closed-door meeting with the big boss was rarely good news. She held her smile in place as she followed directions. Take a seat, Richard turned a palm toward one of the black and chrome chairs in front of his desk. How are you feeling? She swallowed. I'm fine. The kidnappers didn't do permanent damage. Thank God for that. Richard glanced down at an open folder on his desk. I've received the doctor's report, and he's cleared you to return to work. Nothing broken or damaged beyond a few bruises, he said. That right? He looked directly into Jordan's eyes and watched carefully as she spoke. His demeanor was setting off alarm bells in her chest. Right. I'm ready to get back to work. But her voice sounded weak in her own ears. That's what I wanted to talk to you about. He clasped his hands together on the desktop. Her stomach was in full-on revolt now. She tried to look calm, but she couldn't possibly speak. She nodded. You've been working with us about 60 days now. This seems like a good time to give you a little progress report. Let you know how we think you're doing here. She nodded again. If she was getting fired, she'd damn well be dignified about it. You're a natural investigator, Jordan. You absolutely have an amazingly good nose for news. You're good at recognizing a story when you see one, even when others don't see it. And you're fearless in pursuit of your stories. You have everything it takes to develop into an excellent MMJ. Richard reached for his coffee cup and sipped. His praise reduced Jordan's nervousness a bit, but she could feel the hammer coming. Thank you. I really love this place. Nothing would make me happier than to have the MMJ position. Is that true? Richard cocked his head and watched her for a moment. Because it seems to us that you're not as set on that path as you say you are. Her heartbeat galloped like stampeding horses. What do you mean? He sat back in his chair and his demeanor relaxed slightly. Jordan, even though he's not as talented as you are, Drew is doing a better job. You've no doubt figured that out for yourself already. She said nothing. She knew because Teresa had already told her. And because she could see it for herself in the way Patricia and the others treated Drew. Do you know why Drew's excelling? Because he does the job we ask him to do. He never lets us down. He's always there when we need him. He never ignores his assignments or goes off on a tangent that can lead to liability or complaints against Channel 12, which we can't afford and definitely don't want to deal with. Richard inhaled a deep breath. Drew hasn't been in trouble even once since he started here. He is always an asset to the team, Jordan. Can you honestly say that about yourself? She blinked. Hard. Her throat was parched. She wasn't sure she could utter a word. But Richard was clearly waiting for her response. Well, her voice cracked. She swallowed. I've turned in some great work. Breaking stories Channel 12 wouldn't have had at all otherwise. I've worked on my own a lot more than Drew has because I'm interested in being an MMJ, not just a reporter or a photographer. I want to do it all. He shook his head, as if she'd missed his point entirely. I've given you chances to showcase your work. You've turned me down. Twice. Drew never does that. Richard ran a hand through his hair. He blew out a stream of exasperated air through pursed lips. Jordan, do you think I'm an idiot? Or that Patricia is incompetent? Do you think everyone who works here, Teresa, Anthony, everybody is less qualified than you are? Of course not. 
What a preposterous thing to accuse. Then give us some credit for knowing our jobs. Knowing how to run a news organization. Knowing how to train an intern. Trust me, we've done it hundreds of times before. When we give you an assignment, we have a reason. We have a plan here, every day. It affects all of us, not just you. Richard leaned in and spoke softly. You're not doing yourself any favors by making an enemy of Patricia, either. She can help you or hurt you. You're making it very easy for her to choose which path to take. Hell, half the newsroom is on her side in this, and you know she's not exactly beloved around here. Jordan sat back in her chair like she'd been sucker punched. Patricia was always on her case, not the other way around. Patricia had a crush on Drew, and she took every opportunity to show it while she tried to keep Jordan under her thumb. Surely Richard could see that. Look, Jordan, I like you. I think you've got more raw talent than I've seen in a young person in years. I fought to keep you here when the budget said we couldn't even bring you on board. I've even managed to get some insurance coverage to pay for that phone you destroyed on your first day. Didn't you wonder why we haven't been deducting any payments from your paycheck? I want you to succeed. He took another deep breath and exhaled slowly as he searched her face for some indication of something. But it's not up to me. You need to decide whether you want to investigate crime or report the news. You can't do both. Not here. We're a news team. He jerked his thumb over his shoulder, pointing north. The cop shop is across the river. Jordan could think of nothing to say that wouldn't make matters worse. It's time for the afternoon meeting. He stood and grabbed a pad and pen. Think about what I said, Jordan. I will. She stood and managed to maintain her balance on wobbly legs. But you have to know I want to stay here. This is the best job in the world for me. I will do well here. You'll see. I hope that's true. Richard nodded and turned a palm out, directing her toward the exit. Chapter 10 The last thing Jordan felt like doing was attending the afternoon meeting or the confab with Clayton afterward. She had more important things to figure out, like how to keep her job. But everything was in place, and the wheels were already grinding. She had no choice. She flagged Drew down and pulled him aside on the way. Hey, come here. Sure. What's up? Hands in his pockets, he sauntered behind her into the break room. My friend Clayton with the Tampa Police Department is coming to the station to give me an update on the Ruby Quinn case. He said something about an Evan Groves update, too. Would you mind being a second pair of ears? Jordan would have been suspicious if he'd made the offer to her. Given their competition, access to an inside source on a story like the Ruby Quinn murder? Too good to be given away. Of course. One side of Drew's mouth lifted when he smiled. I'd love to. Drew was the most happy-go-lucky reporter she'd ever met. He didn't have a suspicious bone in his body. Why would he? He was winning the competition, and he had to know that. Nothing had ever gone wrong for the guy in his life, as far as she knew. Excellent. Jordan shrugged. She already had a big lead on this story. Drew shouldn't pose a threat to her. Three o'clock. Works for me. He smiled again and sauntered into the conference room. He plopped into the chair next to Antonio Vega, Channel 12 star reporter. Those two were bonded like peanut butter and jelly. Jordan squared her shoulders, held her head high, and followed Drew. Teresa Parma, her best friend at work, waved from where she stood in the corner. Jordan smiled and sat across from Patricia, the assignment editor who was clearly not on Jordan's side. For the next half hour, she tried to follow Richard's advice and be a member of the Channel 12 team with Patricia as the captain. She bit her tongue three times in the process. The afternoon meeting left Jordan with the easy assignment of writing an update on the flu season, and Drew was assigned to cover a bedbug outbreak at a local hotel. Neither story would be a big challenge or a big win. The day should end in a tie. But first, the meeting with Clayton. He was waiting for Jordan and Drew right on time, outside the main lobby. 
Jordan led them down a sidewalk toward the Hills River at the back of the building. She introduced them quickly along the way. They reached a couple of benches. A good meeting spot near the building, but out of earshot of eavesdroppers. Jordan's shoes sunk into the soft soil under the grass. Sunlight glistened off the water, and the area was strangely quiet. She pulled her shoes free and sat. Thanks for meeting us here, Clayton. I wanted to bring Drew in on this because I need a co-worker who can help me brainstorm some theories. The excuse sounded lame even to her. But it was the only thing she could think of to say. Jordan wanted to be an MMJ. That meant she needed to work alone. Bringing along a co-worker was the last thing she ever wanted to do. But cops usually work in pairs, so maybe Clayton wouldn't notice that Jordan had sabotaged herself to avoid being alone with him. Clayton eyed Drew, sizing him up. Then he settled into his seat next to Jordan on the bench, turned to face her and puffed up his chest. Okay, we got the results from the backpack you found. But since then, something major happened. First the backpack results, Jordan said. Clayton looked at Jordan, ignoring Drew. Evan Grove's DNA is on the backpack, so it probably does belong to him. Or at least he's used it at some point. We can tie him solidly to it. But? Jordan asked. Clayton didn't hesitate. There's male DNA on the syringes you found inside, but that DNA doesn't belong to Evan Groves. It's DNA from Peter Wren. Groves was probably supposed to dump the whole backpack in the river or something, but he didn't. Who knows why? So Groves wore gloves when the two of them killed Ruby Quinn. Drew had remained standing, hands resting in his pockets, back to the river. He seemed relaxed, like he always was. Good if we could prove it, but we can't. Clayton shrugged and clasped his hands together loosely. Prosecution isn't sure they can win the death penalty without his DNA on the syringes, or, like I told Jordan before, something else that ties Groves directly to the Ruby Quinn murder. They are considering a plea deal. Jordan didn't like the news, but most criminal cases were resolved by a deal of some sort. She'd been expecting this. What kind of deal are they thinking? The best one they can get, given the evidence, Clayton said. They'd take the death penalty off the table. He'd get life, which means he spends the rest of his life in prison in Florida. No chance of early release. And he'd testify against the cartel. The cartel? Drew's eyes narrowed and his head cocked. Clayton kept his gaze on Jordan. El Pulpo came looking for the backpack after you took it. Evan Groves was working with Dr. Peter Wren, and both of them distributed Super Adderall for the cartel. We figure Groves has evidence on the cartel, and Dia wants it. So prosecutors will offer him a deal if he testifies. Right, Jordan said to stop Drew's questions. Clayton had already told Jordan most of this after she handed over the backpack to him. Only the DNA results were new information and Clayton could have told her that on the phone. He still says he didn't kill Ruby Quinn? Jordan asked. He's claiming Wren did that alone? Clayton nodded and tapped his hand on his knee. Lots of circumstantial evidence incriminating for Groves, though. His fingerprints are all over the clinic, including the room where Ruby Quinn died. Wren's fingerprints are there too, Drew said. Along with a hundred other people. It's a college health clinic. People are in and out all the time. Our case would have been worse if no Evan Groves prints had been found. Clayton shrugged. Groves has been using a fake identity and counterfeit documents, like his passport and driver's license. Oh, and the liquid in the syringes, it matches the super Adderall drug that Ruby Quinn overdosed on. It definitely caused her death, and it definitely came from the medicine factory in Haiti. So yeah, not looking good for Evan Groves. But if he goes to trial, the evidence doesn't tie him to the actual murder. He'd maybe be convicted of something else. Like accessory or something. But not Ruby's murder. That's what you're saying? Jordan wanted a clear answer. Clayton nodded. Not likely that he'd get off free. So yeah. When is all of this going to happen? Jordan had only begun chasing down the new facts she'd learned about Evan Aaron's connection to her mom. 
She thought she'd have plenty of time. Hard to say. Soon they hope. Drew leaned in. What's the other big news? Clayton ran his fingers through his hair with both hands and exhaled. Okay. Jordan hoped she hadn't made a mistake bringing Drew now. She hadn't expected Clayton might share big breaking news. Basically, after they started talking about a plea deal that included his testimony against the cartel, Clayton paused. Someone tried to kill Evan Groves. Jordan dropped her notepad and gripped both hands to the bench. So Evan Groves is definitely involved in the cartel? The timing could be coincidental, but it happened after that other guy died. The one they arrested for kidnapping you. Clayton crossed his arms over his chest. Drew said, looks like Evan Groves knows too much, doesn't it? Somebody doesn't want him to testify. Wait a minute. After what other guy died? Jordan felt all the color drain from her face. Her mouth dried up. What happened to Hugo Diaz? Clayton shook his head. Not him. The other one. The big dude. Gordo? I mean Pippo. Jordan had dubbed him Gordo in her head before she'd learned his real name. Right. Pippo Sanchez. Suicide. Where have you been? Clayton narrowed his eyes as if she was playing dumb, and he didn't like it. On forced leave for the past week, that's where she'd been. Not keeping up with the news because every time she tried, her dad or Claire or the doctor or someone turned it off and jumped all over her. Besides, a Dead Hills County jail inmate wouldn't be big news to anyone who didn't already know Pippo Sanchez. It would have been a small story, quickly over. She might have missed it anyway. How could he commit suicide while he was in jail? Don't they watch the inmates better than that? Jordan couldn't wrap her head around it. Pippo killed himself. Clayton squirmed. It happens. It shouldn't. But it does. What was the attempt against Groves? Drew asked. Somebody tried to strangle him and make it look like suicide. Same as Pippo. Good news is that this time he screwed up. He paused again, looked down and then gazed straight at Jordan. Groves fought back. A hundred faces flashed through Jordan's mind, then she zeroed in on one. Hugo Diaz is in the same jail now. Arrested with Pippo. Think he'll be next? It's possible. Clayton nodded. We've doubled security. But the point is that someone is reaching out to silence these guys. Probably El Pulpo or a rival. And it's likely they'll keep trying until they succeed. Drew said something but Jordan barely heard. Her face warmed and her heartbeat thrashed in her ears. They're killing everyone. They don't want anyone to testify. That means they really do want me dead too. She said it in a whisper, inaudible above the thumping of her heart. Sparks of terror climbed from her stomach up her chest and into her neck. Her lips began to quiver. I've been involved in all of these El Pulpo cases, one way or another. I even went to the medicine factory in Haiti and connected Dr. Wren to the super Adderall that killed Ruby. They won't stop until they've made sure I'm unable to testify, too. I'll protect you. Clayton said, not even bothering to argue with her logic. Well, me and Tampa PD. That's our job. She'd been living in denial and she'd liked living there. Jordan's body tensed as she felt the terror rise to her face. You can't protect me against a freaking drug cartel. They're killing people in your own jail. If she'd had something to throw, she would have hurled it at him. Jordan jumped to her feet to stomp away her fear. She felt her phone ring in her bag. Her fury paused when she saw the name on her phone, Tom Clark. We've already been watching you, Jordan, Clayton said. And your dad. You know we can do this. Be reasonable. Stop doing crazy stuff on your own. Stay where we can see you. Keep your phone with you at all times so we can track you. He stood up and placed his hand on her shoulder. This is our job. Let us do it, okay? Her phone rang again. Jordan continued to glare at him. Blood rushed in her ears and heat flushed all the way from her toes. Clayton's phone rang now too. He reached into his pocket. I gotta go. 
Stay here at the station where you've got plenty of people around you until the end of your shift. I'll figure out something by then. If you have to leave the building for any reason, call me. Her phone rang for the third time. Clayton shook his head and his phone rang again too. Remember what I said. Stay put. I'll call you before the end of the night. He answered his phone and hoofed quickly out to his cruiser in the parking lot while Jordan watched him go. Drew whistled, low and quiet. Man, you really do get yourself into some situations, don't you? What are you going to do now? Chapter 11 Jordan exhaled, calmed her voice, and answered her phone on the final ring. Hi, Tom. Jordan? Is this a bad time? He sounded as nice and normal as ever. No. Her emotional roller coaster clouded her excitement. Maybe she'd feel something closer to normal herself if she kept him talking. How have you been? he asked, like any normal person would. Good, good. She wished that were true. Stressful day at work, but I'm coping. Actually, one thing that's been helping is that I've been training for your 5K. Truth was, Jordan didn't need to train. Three miles was a casual jog for her. But she was sincerely interested in Tom, and she wanted him to know it. And she wanted to think about something other than El Pulpo. Awesome. I hope I can keep up with you. The more he talked, the calmer she felt. Which was a good thing, even if Drew was pacing like a caged lion in front of her. She gestured that the call would be short. He nodded. Tom cleared his throat. He'd said something she missed. That is, I wanted to know when I can see you again. Absolutely. Wait. No. It wasn't a yes or no question. I mean yes, let's find a time for sure. I work weekends though. My days off are Tuesdays and Wednesdays. He sighed into the phone. He wasn't available? I don't know if I can wait that long, he said. She didn't see that one coming. She felt a genuine grin lift her mouth for half a moment. Tom was easygoing, so his urgency surprised her. But he was also easy to figure out. No drama. No guesswork. He wanted to see her, and he let her know that. Direct. She liked it. Her life already had more than enough intrigue. He cleared his throat again. Damn. She should pay attention. Jordan? I said, how about tonight? She cringed. She wasn't exactly available for happy hour like most people, even before Clayton's warnings. But she didn't have the time or the desire to explain her situation. I work until 11.30 tonight. That's okay. I can meet you at 11.35. Anywhere. You pick. Downtown? Jordan's stomach turned cartwheels. A date. With Tom Clark. Tonight. The pressure she'd felt on the blind setup at Infidel Brewery was over now. She'd gotten it out of her system and had become much more relaxed with the idea of hanging out with Tom Clark, the chill, easygoing guy with nothing to prove. How about that new outdoor bar the backyard? Jordan said without thinking. Can we do 11.45? It will take me that long to get there and park. I suppose I can be seen at a bar other than my own. I've got to check out the competition, right? Tom teased. I'll pick you up at the front entrance to the station at 11.35. Jordan heard a smile in his voice. Her life was anything but normal at the moment, but she needed to believe she'd get back to that state. She'd be a total basket case otherwise. See you soon. She dropped her phone in her bag, squeezed her eyes, and smiled upward toward the heavens. She wasn't sure why she liked Tom Clark so much. But she did. Drew's first question snapped her right back to the present, though. I guess you're okay with that cartel taking you and your boyfriend out permanently tonight, huh? Honestly, I don't know what to think. And she would not be discussing her feelings for Tom Clark with Drew Hodges. Ever. She swiped both hands through her hair and walked back to the newsroom with him. They both needed to get back to work. And Clayton was right that she was safer inside the building than outside of it. For now. 
It all seems so surreal, you know. Clayton said he'd work it out by tonight. Surely El Pulpo is no match for law enforcement though. Right? You tell me. Your house was bombed. You were kidnapped. People around you are being killed pretty regularly too. Drew pulled the lobby door open, and she walked into the refrigerated air, and they made their way to the elevator. In your shoes, I might want to hide under the bed for a while. With a gun. And a bodyguard. She gave him a playful punch in the arm while they waited for the elevator to reach the second floor. Very funny. He raised his eyebrows. You think I'm kidding? The elevator door opened. Before she stepped out he said, Seriously Jordan. Your pal Clayton may not be your idea of a great date, but he knows his business. You should listen to him. And you should at least give Tom a chance to make his own decisions. He may not want to be living in the crosshairs, you know? Jordan nodded. You've got your assignment and I've got mine. But when you get back, let's brainstorm this thing, okay? Yeah, sure. Glad to help. He left in search of something and Jordan was glad to see him go. He asked too many good questions. And he was right on all points. Jordan found an unoccupied edit bay and closed the doors for privacy. She called the number she'd programmed into her speed dial after their first meeting at the FBI's downtown headquarters. FBI Special Agent Terry Reiser would give Jordan the straight facts. Reiser would know what to do. But her phone rang six times and then went to voicemail. Jordan hung up without leaving a message. Now what? One thing at a time, Jordan. Get your assignment done. Do the flu story. Make Patricia and Richard happy. Then you can move on. Maybe Clayton will have a solution by then. Or Tom Clark can wait. But that was the least desirable option. She finished writing and editing her summary of the status of the flu in the Tampa Bay area as compared to the national status. The task went by quickly because she was still flying on adrenaline born of alternating euphoria and fear. When the cantankerous Patricia, leaving for coffee, asked how her assignment was going, Jordan looked at her watch. 9.30 p.m., I'll have it done for 11. Which was true. Because the piece was already done. Patricia grunted and kept walking. Jordan had two more hours to fill before her shift ended unless she got another assignment. Now what? After the conversation with Richard, she figured her days here were numbered. She might still win this competition, sure. But if she didn't, she would no longer have access to Channel 12 archives, either. She checked her phone for any messages from Tom Clark. None. Nothing from Agent Reiser or from Clayton. She was stalling. How much emotional battering could she take in one day? Suck it up, Jordan. Just do it. Great. Now she was talking to herself like a shoe commercial. She'd start with the police press conference about her mom's death. The presser should contain only the public news. And that should have been reported in the paper and she'd read all of the newspaper accounts many times. This was something she needed to do and could only do using the Channel 12 archives. But it shouldn't be more than she could handle tonight. And she might get lucky. The video could include comments or questions or that were never pulled and published. Something that hadn't seemed relevant or newsworthy at the time, but might be helpful now. Sandy Wall, the Channel 12 investigative reporter who had covered her mother's murder, told her how to find the tape. He'd said to search the video archives for Nelson Fox and to limit the date range to 30 days after the murder. So that's what she did. Sandy was right. Her dad's name appeared in several anchor scripts, starting on the date of the murder and going forward for about four weeks. After that, his name wasn't mentioned at all. She found what she was looking for six days after the murder. The portion of the script that included her dad read, AT a press conference this afternoon, Tampa police confirmed Nelson Fox was a person of interest. Nothing was missing from the text though, because ellipses were spaced throughout news scripts to help anchors pace their sentences while reading from the teleprompter. His name was mentioned several more times, along with hammering the person of interest thing. 
Even now, after all this time, the words carried staggering power to crush her spirit. Chapter 12 Jordan knew her dad had been a person of interest almost from the second they found her mom's body. Understandable. Female victims of violence were usually hurt or killed by the men closest to them. But that didn't make it true in Nelson Fox's case, or easier to bear. The script for the press conference report was important because it was attached to a date and time. The 6 page M newscast on December 10, six days after her mom was murdered. The police press conference, or presser, was held earlier that afternoon. Now she could find the video. Jordan scanned through the list of old video of all press conferences. There had been only one presser that day. The archives contained unedited raw footage that rolled from before the beginning until after the end. There were pieces of video that potentially had never aired anywhere. Jordan swallowed hard. It never got easier to hear people discuss her mother's murder. She tried to compartmentalize her feelings, and on most days she managed. Video of this media event might gush open the doors of containment. No time for that, Jordan. You've got a date tonight. You don't want to look like you've been watching a tearjerker movie. Suck it up. She took a deep breath, squared her shoulders, and hit play on the computer. The video captured a small, packed room. Fluorescent lights shined on blue carpet and cheap white walls. Reporters, photographers, tripods, and wires were strewn everywhere. Jordan knew the room was even smaller than it looked on camera, so it would have been hot and stuffy too. She imagined the room smelled like stale coffee and sweat, and the vibe was the anxious anticipation of an oncology waiting room. The police department's wooden seal adorned the podium at the front. A styrofoam coffee cup rested atop the podium, and several others dotted the room. Drinking coffee out of styrofoam cups was such an ordinary thing to do. This day was not ordinary. This was the day the public would hear, officially, formally, and in as much detail as the police wanted to share, about the murder of Brenda Fox. Jordan's nostrils flared and her breath shortened, and she felt heat rising from her chest along her throat and face all the way to her hairline. Rage won't get you anywhere right now. Be observant. She simply couldn't manage the anger, even after all this time. Photogs and reporters mingled before the press conference started. A few smiled and talked casually, probably about something stupid and completely unimportant like movies or sports. Jordan's stomach turned. She understood journalists couldn't get emotionally immersed in every story they covered, but it was still hard to see this time. The deputy chief of police approached the bundle of microphones at the podium, and the room quieted. The chief cleared his throat. Thank you all for being here. We wanted to provide an update on what we know so far about the details of the Brenda Fox murder case. As you know, Mrs. Fox was murdered in her home Tuesday night between 6 o'clock and 7 o'clock. She was stabbed several times. The knife blow that killed her was a wound to her heart. Jordan's head throbbed. She could barely stand to watch. But she had to. She listened as the very most basic details of the case were revealed. The ones she could recite in her sleep. We do believe more than one person was involved. Mrs. Fox's husband, Nelson Fox, is being questioned as a person of interest. We have no reason to believe Mrs. Fox was targeted, though the investigation continues. We fully intend to track down the individuals who committed this heinous crime and punish them to the full extent of the law. The police chief then opened the floor to questions. Has there been other crime in the area? Nothing beyond the standard trends. But it is worth noting that a mile away, a homeowner reports having two bikes stolen. And two bikes were left near the scene. We are working on obtaining a sketch based on a description of those individuals. Individuals. Police weren't even specifying gender back then. The two bikes had turned out to be unrelated. But the police chief wouldn't have known that on the day of this presser. Have you found any signs of forced entry to the home? No signs of forced entry. Do you see a motive for Nelson Fox? We are not releasing details as that aspect of the investigation is ongoing. 
Is it true you found two sets of boot prints leaving the back of the house? We found two sets of fishing boot prints, yes. Male or female? The sizes were too large for most women. Is it true that Nelson Fox's fishing boots are the same size as the prints you found leaving the scene of the murder? We are not releasing details, as that aspect of the investigation is ongoing. Are you exploring the possibility that the killers escaped by water, since the house backed up to the Hills River? We are not releasing details, as that aspect of the investigation is ongoing. Was anything stolen? Brenda Fox's wallet. Was anything else stolen? Not that we've identified at this time. Have you found the murder weapon? No murder weapon has been located at this time. Have you identified the type of knives used in the attack? We are not releasing details, as that aspect of the investigation is ongoing. Jordan rolled her neck. She wasn't getting anywhere. Still, she let the last few moments of the press conference play out. Was anything left behind? No. Nothing was left behind. Jordan wanted to give the reporter the answer herself. They pulled off the perfect crime, ma'am. Nothing left behind. But the police chief nodded. We're not going to answer that because we're not going to answer any questions that would impede our active and ongoing investigation. Though he was saying no, he continued to nod. Was it possible that something had been left behind? She could ask for the police files again, but she'd already tried. Several times. Because the investigation was still technically open, the files and the evidence were not available for review. The only information she could get about the case was information the police chose to release. And they'd made it plain that they weren't releasing anything more. Jordan had to get her dad's signature on that consent form to get her dad's file from Jenny Lane, the lawyer who took over his records after his original lawyer died. At the time her dad was a focus of the investigation, his lawyer might have had access to more evidence than what was shared with the public. Something had happened, eventually, to make the police believe her dad had not killed his wife. Jordan needed to know what that something actually was. Maybe it was because of whatever had been left behind. No question about it now. She owed it to her mother. She owed it to her dad, too. He still lived under that cloud of suspicion. It was long past time for him to be declared innocent to the people who had tried and convicted him in every public arena, even though he'd never been formally accused. And Jordan needed to know who killed her mom. She deserved justice, too. And she would get it. If only she could figure out how. Chapter 13 Clayton texted around 11 p.m. After work, a squad car would follow her to the mansion and park outside overnight. We'll call later, he'd said. Jordan should have called Tom Clark and told him not to come. But she'd had a tumultuous day, and he was a friendly face. She wanted to see him, even though Drew was right. They couldn't go anywhere tonight. She walked out promptly at 11.35. Tom was parked at the curb in front of the station. The TPD squad car Clayton had promised waited not far from Tom's SUV. So far, so good. Jordan hustled to Tom's vehicle and slid into the passenger seat, but she left the door open. He looked good. Really cute, in a comforting, ordinary way. He wore a casual shirt, sleeves rolled to his forearms and jeans. Jordan's stomach flipped around like a kid waiting for an amusement ride. She put her hand on his arm, and static electricity snapped between them. She pulled her hand back and he pulled his arm back at the same time. They both laughed. Really laughed. Man, that laughter felt good. You should do that more often. Jordan touched his bicep this time and felt his muscles through his shirt. Tom, I'm sorry. I should have called, but I wanted to explain in person. I can't go out with you tonight. Did something happen? Concern knitted his eyebrows together at the bridge of his nose. What's wrong? She felt relaxed with Tom Clark. He was trustworthy. Honest. She could tell. They'd had an almost instant connection when they first met. Every meeting and conversation since then had reinforced her feelings. 
Teresa vouched for him too, which helped. Teresa was about as level-headed as anyone could get. Besides, nothing about El Pulpo was a secret. No reason not to tell him. Go with your gut, Jordan. Don't overthink this. She told Tom quickly about being kidnapped by El Pulpo and how one of the kidnappers had died in jail. She told him about someone trying to kill Evan Groves and how Clayton was worried about her safety and had organized a Tampa PD protective detail. So yeah, she wrapped up the story. I might be a target. His nostrils flared and he raised his arms and waved them around. Were you going to tell me any of this? She shrugged. Tom's face remained stone cold for a moment. I think you're underestimating how much danger you're in. Good news is that I'm not staying at home right now. She told him about her house-sitting job. Does the house-sitting mansion have an alarm system? Tom was easygoing, but he was careful too. She liked that about him. Jordan nodded. It's like Fort Knox if you try to drive in. But the house has an open backyard where boats can easily approach. Tom scowled. That's it, I'm staying there with you tonight. Warmth radiated through Jordan's body, and she realized she'd been a little uneasy about staying alone after she'd heard Clayton's news. But she stood firm on her plan. I'll be okay, really. I can call Clayton and ask him to have a police boat drive by every so often. Why do you think this cartel is gonna let police catch them when police have failed so far? No way. Tom gestured for her to close the door. I'd invite you to stay with me, but you've got better security than I do. If this mansion is as big as you say it is, there will be plenty of room for both of us to sleep far, far apart. He winked. Though I'm not sure I'll get much sleeping done, keeping an eye out for El Pulpo. Jordan grinned. And what exactly will you do when you see El Pulpo arrive? Probably pee my pants and call Clayton. They both had another good hearty laugh, and Jordan felt beyond satisfied about the decision to let Tom stay. She would feel better having someone with her in that empty house. He cared about her, he had a great sense of humor, and he wasn't afraid to admit that he was weaker than a cartel. That last bit didn't make her feel more secure, but she liked him for saying it. You're a very persuasive guy, Tom Clark. But I need to drive my own car. She closed the passenger door and clicked her seatbelt firmly into place. Which way do we go? He put the SUV in drive and rolled toward the parking garage where she'd left Hermes. Jordan ducked to look in the side mirror and watched the cruiser follow closely behind. She transferred to her own vehicle and the three-car parade rolled out. Ten minutes later, she stopped at the guard station to explain the two cars behind were with her. After checking ID and taking fingerprints and slapping the barcode sticker on Tom's SUV, they drove through the neighborhood with the cruiser behind. Jordan and Tom parked in the driveway. The cruiser parked across the street. Wow. Tom said when they met at the fountain. This is quite the house. Jordan smiled. It looks even better in daylight. Follow me. As they walked in the back door, Jordan's phone dinged. One new voicemail. It's from Linda. The homeowner. Jordan played the message on speakerphone. Jordan. Linda's voice sounded urgent. LFC Cleaning called to say they were looking for Maria, the new girl who cleaned the house. She didn't show up at her next assignment. When you get a chance, tomorrow morning maybe, could you call LFC and let them know whatever you know or don't know? I'll text you their phone number when I hang up, okay? Thanks for taking care of things. Jordan's brows pinched together. Maria's missing? Who's Maria? Tom asked. One of the two girls who cleaned the house today. The younger, more fragile one. Jordan paced the room. Maria left with Edith when they finished cleaning. Their supervisor picked them both up in a company van. But Linda's message said the company is looking for Maria. That doesn't make much sense, does it? She threw her hands up. Not to me. Think I should call LFC tonight? Might as well wait till morning. I doubt they're open this late. Jordan felt a little queasy about waiting, though. Her supervisor? His name was Felix. Real creep. 
He might have done something to her. How was he a creep? Tom's breath came out in a little spurt through his nose. Jordan remembered something. She'd snapped those photos when Felix picked the girls up this afternoon. She pulled her phone out, found the photos, and showed them to Tom. Tell me that guy doesn't look like a creep to you. Wish I could say that. He looks like a perv for sure. Tom nodded slowly. Which one of the girls is Maria? The shorter one. She's so young. Tom flipped through the photos several times. He enlarged the best picture of Maria standing near the back of the van. What's that on her wrists and ankles? Tattoos. Jordan swallowed hard. Bruises. Changed my mind. Tom looked up from the phone and handed it back to her. Call your guy Clayton. This is not right. Hearing Tom confirm Jordan's gut made her nervous in more ways than one. She was used to people telling her she was imagining things. She liked having a guy around who believed her and saw things the same way she did. But in this case, she'd wanted to be wrong. For Maria's sake. There's beer in the fridge. Grab a couple while I call. She dialed Clayton's personal cell. He picked up on the first ring. What's up? You're okay? On my way. No. I'm fine. Really? I'm calling about something else. The last thing she wanted tonight was him riding over here on his white horse. But he was concerned about her and protecting her, just like he'd promised. Which was a good thing. What is it? He seemed a little annoyed now. He probably knew Tom Clark was here. The guys in the squad car would have told him. Keep it professional, Jordan. A girl is missing. She was here working today and she didn't show up for her next cleaning job. I didn't know you had a cleaning service. Like that was relevant. I'm house-sitting for Linda Pierce. It's her cleaning service. Lemony Fresh Cleaning. The girl's name is Maria. Jordan took the cold beer that Tom handed her and raised it toward him in a silent toast. She left here about, oh, maybe one o'clock. I haven't seen her since. Okay, Clayton said. I'll check it out. You call me if you need anything. Thank you, Clayton. She's young. And she looked exhausted and frightened. Jordan took a sip of the beer. Got it. And Jordan? Yes. Since there's a canal behind that house that feeds into the bay, we'll be sending a patrol boat by. Didn't want you to be worried about it. Thank you, she said again before he rang off. Tom leaned against the counter, arms crossed, sipping his beer. Clayton agreed to look into Maria's disappearance? He did. Tom cocked his head. But you'll look into it yourself in the morning, won't you? She smiled. You know me pretty well already. They both seemed to be on the same page about morning, as in they didn't want it to come too soon. So they watched a scary movie and sat an awkward distance apart on the couch. Jordan felt like she was in high school or something. It had been so long since she'd dated. Then, mid-movie, Tom started talking as if he'd been thinking about something else the whole time. How old are you? What? He smiled. You heard me. I get to know the age of the woman I'm sleeping over with, right? Over is the keyword there, buddy, she said, jabbing his arm. I'm 22. Perfectly respectable. What's that supposed to mean? They both turned on the couch, now seated cross-legged and facing each other. I'm three years older than you and your perfect dating material, and I can't imagine why no one has snatched you up yet. Jordan's stomach turned backflips. She liked this guy. A lot. She leaned in and kissed him. It was the only response she could not even think of. It was the only response possible. Just one simple kiss. One slow, extended peck on the lips, eyes closed. Besides her ex and that crazy, spontaneous thank you kiss she'd given Clayton, Jordan hadn't really kissed another man since what, freshman year of college? She'd almost forgotten how much she liked kissing. This guy was sweet and so perfect, he probably liked baseball, her dad's favorite sport. Regardless, her dad would like him for sure. Sometime soon, she'd have to explain that she couldn't date seriously right now. 
and she wanted to get back to her mom's hard drive. But she didn't have to do either of those things just yet. Chapter 14 Jordan woke up the next morning when her bedroom door creaked open. Tom came in carrying two cups of coffee. He'd slept on the couch downstairs, even though there were plenty of other bedrooms. Of course, Jordan didn't invite him to her bed. Way too soon for that. I figured out how to work the fancy coffee machine here. He smiled. I know a lot more about brewing beer than coffee, but I think it just might have turned out all right. Caramel? With a hint of citrus? Jordan sniffed audibly as she blinked to meet his gaze and adjust to the morning sunlight. Her hair was probably a mess, and she was sure she had eye makeup smeared around her face. But she really didn't care. A guy who brought her coffee in bed. Jordan would have fallen head over heels for that alone. She wiped underneath her eyes. Maybe she did care. Just a little bit. He sat on the edge of the bed. She propped herself up, processing everything that had happened the day before, and sipped the coffee. Last night they'd kissed. Briefly, but they'd kissed. Now he'd expect more. It wasn't that she didn't like it, but she needed to do things like take care of her dad. She needed to go home and check on him. Now, actually, she was scheduled to work today. Clayton had said to call him to check on Maria. And oh yeah, focus on staying alive. Um, the coffee's great. She sipped again. Is that girl still missing? Tom frowned. Maria? I don't know. I should have checked the news or something. I'm sorry. You want your phone so you can call the cleaning service. He unplugged her phone from the charger and handed it to her. Jordan called the number Linda left on the message last night. Hi, I'm returning a call about an employee who I'm told never showed up to her next assignment. Maria. Is she still missing? Yes, she didn't show up for work today. She was last seen at the Pierce house. Is that you? Yes. Could you please confirm what time she left? About one. Her supervisor picked her up in the van, along with the other girl, Edith. I see. Thank you, I will pass the word along. Wait. Is this a missing person case? If it is, I want to help. But I don't want to get her in trouble. There was a pause on the other end. You'd have to ask her family. Curious answer. Because why wouldn't it be a missing person case? Jordan suddenly felt more focused on work and less on Tom. Now was a good time to break everything to him. I've got to go home. She scooted out of bed and pulled the covers up. My dad lives there and he's in a wheelchair, so I have to check on him. Then I need to get to work and see if we can help with Maria. Tom frowned. Is your dad okay? Jordan rummaged through her bags to find clothes for the day. He had a stroke after my mom's murder, so he's still rehabbing. It's a long process. But he's learning to walk again. Which is a recent development, actually, so we're hopeful. So you have to be home with him to make sure he doesn't fall and stuff. Basically. We have a home nurse, too, who comes and goes. But you know, he needs my support. I only recently left him overnight for the first time, and that was when I went to Haiti for work. And it helps when I can cook for him. Jordan gathered the day's supplies. Tom nodded slowly, lingering as if he was digesting the news. Um, well let me know if there's any way I can help take some of the pressure off you. You've got enough going on watching your own back. I didn't realize you have to watch his, too. She paused and looked at him. She really liked him. But seriously. There was little he could do to help besides provide her with endless beers, which would only lead to hangovers, which would be counterproductive. To be honest, just spending time with you helped take some of the stress off. He beamed. I hope to spend time with you again soon. Text me later and let me know you're okay, will you? I'll head out now. He walked toward the door. And keep me posted on Maria, will you? Definitely. She walked him to the bedroom door. You can see yourself out. He nodded and stepped back toward her. 
Really? It was nice spending time with you. She took a step toward him and bowed her head. Thank you for keeping an eye out for me. They both moved in for a hug or a kiss, but at separate times. It didn't work. Tom Clark left without so much as a handshake. Jordan groaned and held her head in her hands as she heard the back door close behind him. Her life was a disaster. She had plenty to deal with today. She'd see him another time. Soon. She grabbed her phone and called Clayton. You're okay? he asked. What's up? Two things. First, thank you. Really? I felt a lot better knowing police were watching over me last night. She took a deep breath. But I don't want you guys following me around during the day. It's not necessary. And I have a life, Clayton. A job. I need to be able to move around without a police escort. She stopped talking because he hadn't said another word. She heard him breathing, though. Clayton? Are you sleeping? What? No. Well, kind of. Late night. He yawned. But okay. If you need anything, just call. And we'll be back at the end of your shift tonight. She nodded. That was easier than she'd expected. Something else. He sounded like he was nodding off again. What did you find out about Maria? Anything? Another yawn. There's a missing persons report. So far, no reason to suspect anything criminal. But we take missing women seriously. Especially young ones like Maria. There's too much human trafficking that goes on around here, with the port and all. We're on it. You'll call me the moment you learn anything about her? I'm really worried. As soon as she said the words, Jordan realized they were true. She had a bad feeling about Maria, and she wanted her situation resolved. Soon. You bet. But I've got to get some sleep. Let's talk later, okay? An hour later, Jordan walked into her own house. The faint hint of Old Spice wafted to her nose from the kitchen. Hiya, Dad. Well, aren't you chipper this morning? Jordan smiled and leaned in for a hug. I've missed you. He was sitting at his computer, in an actual computer chair, which she hadn't seen him use at all since the stroke. Progress. Major progress. Still, he spent too much time alone. He needed a good friend. His age. Hell, maybe it was even time for him to have a lady friend. Jordan never thought that would cross her mind, but after one semi-romantic night with a new guy, she'd been reminded how good the right companionship could be. Hmm. Something to mull over. She went to the kitchen where her loyal half of a grapefruit waited for her. Thanks for the fruit, Dad. Did you get the rest of your breakfast yet? He threw his head back and let out a single whoop of laughter. Are you kidding me? Hours ago. I'm almost on to lunch now. It was ten o'clock. Later than she'd thought. Chapter 15 Nelson was in a good mood. She saw his walker near the desk chair. Have you gotten much practice using your walker lately? I'm almost as fast as a well-fed turtle. Jordan grinned. I want to talk to you about something. She pulled up a chair next to the computer and swallowed hard. I found some information that might lead to clues about Mom's murder. She flinched as spoke the word out loud. He tilted his head and gazed steadily into her face. I mean, I wouldn't say I have any leads. And I haven't been canvassing our old neighborhood or anything. There's just some stuff. I kind of happened upon at work. Which was sort of true. He raised his eyebrows. Do I want to know? Maybe not yet because it might be nothing. But it might be something. And there's one idea I have about how I can find out. Jordan placed a hand on his arm and squeezed. I know we can't bring mom back, but we can bring the bad guys to justice. His eyes looked like they might be welling up. Or maybe it was the way the lamp and the computer monitor illuminated his glasses. He coughed behind his hand. What's your idea? She swallowed the lump in her throat. I want to look at the case file. 
He shook his head. I don't have a file. It's locked up in some attorney's office somewhere. She crossed her legs and remained calm and composed. I went to see that lawyer, Jenny Lane. And she said, I can look at the file. I just need your signature. Anna. No way. You do not need to get involved. He crossed his arms. If he was close to crying before, he'd moved on. Now he was purely stubborn. If there's something specific you need to see, I'll go to Ms. Lane's office. I'll look at it myself. Dad. Point A, that's not healthy. You don't need extra stress. Neither do you. Fair enough. Looking at that file won't be easy for either one of us. I think we're both adult enough to admit that. My point B is that I'm not 16 years old anymore. I'm still your little girl, but I'm 22. I've been engaged, handled a breakup, and landed a full-time job. She didn't mention all the dangerous things she'd survived since she took the Channel 12 job. That was a direction she didn't want to lead him through. I need to know what happened to Mom. She pulled the consent form for the file out of her sling bag. If you don't sign this, I'm still not giving up. You know me. She smiled gently and squeezed his arm again. I'll find another way to get the information. Clayton could get it for me. She leaned in for emphasis and clasped his hands in hers. I really want to see this file. Nelson's entire face quivered. But it was time for the real truth to come out. Long past time. I think you're right. He bowed his head and sighed loudly. He licked his lips and met her eyes. I'm not happy that you'll see everything in that file. It's very painful to look at the photos and everything else. Jordan didn't trust her voice just yet, so she hugged him. Your mother would be proud of the adult you've become. She would trust your judgment. His eyes glistened, but his mouth turned upward somberly. I don't like this idea. But you have a right to see this file if you want to. She was your mother, after all. I'll sign. And he did. Jordan stood up and hugged him, hard. You have no idea how much this means to me. A tear rolled down her cheek. Thank you for believing in me. His eyes were glassy too. He cleared his throat. I need to tell you something else. She squeezed his shoulder. What is it, Dad? Everything's okay. You can tell me anything. He took a deep breath. The words rushed out, as if he was afraid not to tell her the whole story all at once. I know the password for your mother's hard drive. I've always known it. I didn't want us to deal with any of this. But if you're planning to look at the file, you might as well have the hard drive's password too. What is it? The password? He cleared his throat again and gazed steadily into her eyes. I love Nelson and Jordan. Jordan gave him a long, hard hug. She didn't trust herself to speak. You're a lot braver than I am, Freckles. You always have been. He patted her hand. You'd better make that phone call if you're going to make it to work on time. Jordan went to her room and closed the door and called Jenny Lane's office. This is Jordan Fox. She's probably expecting my call. I'd like to come in this afternoon, if possible. It will only take a moment. I'm sorry, ma'am. She's all booked today. I don't need to meet with her. Would you tell her Jordan Fox has Nelson's signature? Ask her if I can come to pick up the file. She's tied up right now in a deposition, but I'll give her the message when she takes a break. She's going to be busy all day today, I'm afraid. What about tomorrow morning, then? Unfortunately, the office is closed tomorrow for the weekend. Jordan covered her face with her hands. She needed the file now. Before her dad changed his mind, the next best thing was to leave the house before he could change his mind and get back to her mom's hard drive at the mansion. Chapter 16 Jordan walked outside to the mansion's pool to stretch. Clear her mind. Look out over the bay. She stretched her arms above her head and dipped a single toe in the pool. Way too cold for a swim. Using the password, she had opened her mom's hard drive almost instantly. But it contained so many files that the task of finding anything useful overwhelmed her. 
the searching possibilities seemed as broad as the horizon. You're closer than you've ever been before, closer than you think. It was true. She should have figured out her mother's password. It was simple. But everything is simple once you know it. Jordan had located Brenda's calendar on the hard drive. She'd focused on that final day. December 4, 2009. Finish semester paperwork. Jordan swim practice 4 to 6. Nelson meeting 4.30. Dinner, sunshine salmon 7 o'clock sharp. Jordan smiled. Her mother's cooking habits were a family joke. Jordan and her dad preferred plain food, but her mom craved variety. Sunshine salmon sounded exactly like a recipe she'd have found in a magazine and planned to try. One note on Brenda Fox's calendar for that day said talk to Chelsea. Dr. Chelsea Ross, probably. One of Brenda's closest friends. When Jordan was in Haiti with Dr. Ross, she'd said Brenda called about a health question or something like that. Jordan couldn't remember exactly. But her mom's calendar confirmed some sort of connection had been planned. A connection that never happened. One thing she'd noticed was how narrow the window of opportunity had been for Brenda's killer. Timing is everything. Brenda's killer was lucky. A different day, a different time, Jordan's mom might still be alive. Jordan and her dad had tortured themselves with so many ifs. If Jordan had come straight home instead of attending swim practice. If Nelson had come straight home after his school meeting. Now she added to the list, if Dr. Ross had been free to meet Brenda earlier instead of after work. Jordan rubbed her temples. Dr. Ross said mom called earlier in the day to set up the meeting. Something must have prompted her to make the call, maybe something she'd learned that very day. What did she want to talk about, anyway? Nothing sprang into her head. She closed her eyes and turned her face up. The temperature had cooled to a more comfortable level. A slight breeze had kicked up to caress Jordan's skin while the sun's warmth soothed her face. She inhaled the sweet scent of jasmine deeply. Timing is everything, she thought again. Bingo. I can search the hard drive to make the most recent files show up at the top of the list. Jordan typed in the commands to make the computer sort by date modified. In a jiffy, she had thousands of files in a chronological list. She scanned quickly and found what she wanted near the top. Notes to ask Chelsea. Jordan's pulse quickened. The notes document was created the day before Brenda's death and modified the day she died. Yes. She fist pumped the air. The title, Notes to Ask Chelsea, implied multiple questions that Brenda had researched. Which seemed promising. Maybe. Jordan clicked to open the file and scanned the document faster than she could comprehend it. The notes were clinical in language Jordan couldn't quickly decipher. But it was the questions at the end that chilled her blood. She shivered while goose flesh pebbled her skin. She read the last four questions on the list repeatedly. Can he be cured? Medication for a juvenile sociopath? Is he likely to strike again? The questions were confusing, too. When her mom created these notes, Evan Aaron was no longer incarcerated. He'd served his sentence for vehicular manslaughter and had been released at least a couple of months before when he'd turned 18. She'd had no contact with him in more than four years, as far as Jordan had discovered. Why would Brenda be worried about him after all that time? Why was she planning to ask Dr. Ross these questions the day she died? Jordan returned to Brenda's calendar and looked back a few months. She found nothing about Aaron Robinson for the entire year. A quick search for his name turned up nothing in the hard drive files either. If Brenda had had any contact with him at all since his trial, Jordan found nothing on this hard drive to prove it. On a whim she searched Mark Gifford's name. Again, she found nothing. Jordan sat back in her chair and stapled her fingers over her chest to think. The best person to discuss these questions with was Dr. Chelsea Ross, so she grabbed her phone and placed the call before she could chicken out. On the third ring, her mom's friend answered. Hello, Jordan. Dr. Ross's voice was weak, barely above a whisper. Jordan last saw her a month ago. She'd been strong and healthy then. Dr. Ross? Are you sick? 
Can I do something for you? Jordan jumped up and paced the room. I'm improving. She cleared her throat and hacked a dry cough. I have typhoid. A jolt like electric shock hit Jordan's heart and her questions tumbled out. Typhoid. How did you get that? Haven't you been vaccinated? Did you get sick in Haiti? I'm coming over. Right now. You can't. I'm better but I'm still contagious, another hacking cough halted her objections. Jordan heard her sipping something before she continued. I returned to Sabatier the day after I saw you last. Dr. Eric Lee joined me later. Dr. Ross sipped again, and whatever she was drinking helped her raspy voice at least. Thank God. But you were all so careful. Did Dr. Lee get sick too? Is he okay? Dr. Lee had been especially nice and helpful to Jordan when they were all in Haiti last month. She'd talked to him only once since then during a phone call about Evan Groves. Dr. Lee was the Plant University soccer team doctor. He'd helped Jordan identify Evan Groves, which led to Groves' arrest. She hadn't realized he'd returned to Haiti so quickly. A long pause. Finally, Dr. Ross replied, You haven't heard then? Jordan shook her head. Heard what? Eric became ill shortly after he arrived in Haiti. He was the first of us to have symptoms. Another pause. Another sip. He'd been vaccinated, so we didn't diagnose typhoid right away. His condition was advanced before we started treatment, which is how he infected the rest of the team. Jordan's throat closed up and her eyelids felt hot. She knew what had happened, even though Dr. Ross had yet to speak the words. Hearing them would make it all too real. She sat down heavily. Eric died, Jordan. A few days ago. Jordan cleared her throat. And the rest of the medical team? We airlifted everyone back to Tampa. We're all in isolation quarantine at Tampa Southern Hospital. Jordan closed her eyes and pinched the bridge of her nose. Her stomach felt queasy. Jordan. Dr. Ross's voice was weaker, barely audible. Do you have any symptoms? What? No. Her eyes popped open and her breath quickened. Typhoid symptoms? What are they? She'd been feeling fine. Physically. Hadn't she? It starts with fever, headache, cough, general malaise. You've been back from Sabatier for more than a month. You'd have had symptoms after two weeks, her cough erupted. Jordan heard muffled coughing that lasted a while. I'm sorry I didn't ask you about symptoms earlier. I should have. No, no. I'm fine. I've had no symptoms at all. She ran her hand through her hair and rested her elbow on the table to prop her head up. She could have typhoid. She could have exposed her dad. Her whole body began to shake. I'm glad, Jordan. I need to rest now. We'll talk soon, okay? Dr. Ross started to cough again before she ended the call. Jordan sat holding her phone and staring out the mansion's magnificent windows overlooking Tampa Bay. She thought about her time in Haiti. Of all the risks she'd experienced there, including the vicious Taunton Mound Nui, contracting typhoid wasn't something she'd considered. Not even remotely. She pulled the laptop closer to her chair and did a quick search for typhoid. The facts were frightening. Typhoid was highly contagious and treatable with antibiotics. But left untreated, it was often fatal. It was also rare in the United States. Doctors could be forgiven for failing to recognize the symptoms. Typhoid. In Tampa. That was certainly a news story and a serious matter of public health. Yet she'd heard nothing about it on Channel 12 or any competitive station. How could that be? Until she knew more, she wouldn't pitch the story at Channel 12. But she'd follow up with Dr. Ross tomorrow, for sure. Jordan glanced at the clock. If she left now, she'd have time to prepare a good pitch for the afternoon meeting. Chapter 17 Jordan Jenny Lane here. The call came through while Jordan was driving to work. Look, I'm sorry. I know how important this file is to you. But I am completely booked today. 
overbooked, really. Can you come by the office tomorrow morning? I'll be here to catch up on some things. You can give me the signature, and I can give you the file. Shouldn't take too long. Absolutely. I'll be there. The news didn't excite Jordan like she'd expected. Her dad's worries must have seeped into her heart. She chewed on her lower lip. Maybe she'd already opened the lid to her own Pandora's box. Thank you so much, Ms. Lane. I mean Jenny. See you tomorrow. Okay. But Jordan. Jenny's concern came through loud and clear. Yes? Really think about this first. If it was my mom, I wouldn't want to see the contents. Okay, Jordan echoed and rang off, because it was all she could get past the lump in her throat, and she had to get a hold of herself before she faced Patricia. She parked Hermes on the third floor of the parking garage at 2.05 and hurried inside. She'd have enough time to follow up on the missing Maria case before her shift started at 2.30. She logged into a computer in the corner of the newsroom and scanned all official emails from the past three days. She didn't know Maria's last name, but luckily, the number of missing person emails the newsroom received on a daily basis was typically zero to two. Not because people rarely went missing. Exactly the opposite but because reports on most of them were never filed. But this one was, probably thanks to her report to Clayton. Maria Ortiz, age 17, from Warm Haven, Florida, a rural farming community east of Tampa, reported yesterday. If no one had seen her since she left the Pierce house, she'd been missing less than 24 hours. So step one was firm. Maria Ortiz was officially missing. But that wouldn't be enough to make a news story. What had Clayton said? Something about human trafficking in Tampa lately. She created a couple of quick searches and found at least a dozen hits in the past six months. She scanned the material. Florida was the third largest human trafficking state in the country. Men, women, and children were forced to serve in the sex trade, domestic service, and agriculture. A coalition of law enforcement, private sector providers, and citizens were working to help victims with housing, health care, and other needs. Could any of this apply to Maria? Maria had seemed exhausted and dispirited, but she hadn't seemed like she felt forced into anything. Just the opposite. She talked about how she loved her job and wanted to keep it. Those bruises on her wrists and ankles could have an innocent explanation, perhaps. Something about the girl had touched Jordan's heart. Maria seemed too fragile, like an abuse victim maybe. At the time, Jordan had been preoccupied with her own problems, but still, Maria's plight had pierced her armor. Even if it turned out that she'd simply run away with a boyfriend who enjoyed kinky sex, Jordan wanted to help find her before something worse happened. Jordan pitched the story in the afternoon meeting. Missing girl. Young and inexperienced possibly abused. Picture provided by Jordan Fox's phone, but she didn't say that. The pitch was met with enthusiasm colder than Iceland in January. Patricia scowled. People have the right not to show up for work. If that's all you've got on this, it's not worth following. We have a full plate today already. If Jordan fought for her story, maybe Richard would back her up. Seriously? With all the human trafficking problems in Tampa recently? Richard perked up. Do you have any evidence that this is a human trafficking situation? Well, not yet, but Jordan stopped talking before she made a fool of herself by mentioning her news nose said there was something very odd going on here. What's the story exactly? Patricia asked, a little less dismissive after Richard got involved. How do you go about it? Jordan had already pitched the story with everything she knew, which wasn't good enough. So she offered the best approach she could. We go to her house, we talk to her parents about why she was working full-time at age 17. Chances are, her parents won't want to talk, Patricia said, already looking at her notes for a more promising story. Usually, that community shies away from the camera. And everybody knows why she'd be working full-time. The family needed the income. Jordan couldn't believe Patricia wouldn't even give Maria's family a chance. 
Maybe we could call Linda and ask her what she knows about the family situation. Patricia slammed her palm on the table. No means no. Jordan rubbed her arms and scooted back from the table. If Richard hadn't given her orders to get along with Patricia and stop sticking her nose where she wasn't assigned to go, she'd have argued. As it was, if she did anything like follow up on her own now, well, it would be career suicide. She couldn't afford that. Jordan, if you learn anything that makes the missing girl a newsworthy story, bring it up again. Meanwhile, we're gonna put you on this feature story. Richard pulled his chair closer to the table and straightened his tie. There's a little strawberry bakery and cafe opening in Southern Hills County today. Video inside and out of the place and some sound from the owner. Can you set that up and go shoot it? Or do you need us to send someone with you? Strawberries were a big business in Florida. And strawberry picking was the job many of the farm workers like Maria Ortiz's parents did. She glanced at Richard, but his expression told her nothing. Was he throwing her a lifeline here on the Maria Ortiz story? Or did the idea not even cross his mind? But surely the offer meant that he'd heard her objections to Patricia's harsh opinions of what Patricia called Jordan's cowboy antics and bad attitude. Sure, I'd love to. And I can do it on my own. But thanks for asking. Jordan had told him she wanted to be an MMJ, a multimedia journalist. To make that happen, she had to prove she was good at all aspects of the job by herself, not as a tag along with a reporter or hauling a photographer around. She wanted the next job, but she didn't want to be a puppy dog like Drew Hodges to get it. No way. Something was very wrong about Maria. Even Tom thought so. Clayton took the matter seriously, too. Jordan knew she was violating Richard's advice by going off on her own again, not following the news plan, not supporting the team. But Richard hadn't looked into Maria's face. He hadn't seen those bruises on her wrists and ankles. He hadn't watched Edith berate Maria or seen Felix stroke her and yank her about. Jordan couldn't ignore the situation. She just couldn't. Chapter 18 Maria's parents' address was listed on the missing person report. Southern Hills County, where her assignment was taking her anyway. On her way back from the Strawberry Cafe, Jordan took the 15-minute detour. The Ortiz home turned out to be an old camping trailer. The yard was neat, and a few tomato and bell pepper plants thrived in a side garden. Jordan parked behind the ancient, rusty red Chevy pickup truck out front. When a story required her to ring doorbells and possibly go in people's homes, Jordan really preferred to have a photographer with her for safety. But this story was off the books, so she'd have to do it all herself. No doorbell. She rapped on the front door and waited less than a minute before it opened. I'm Jordan Fox from News Channel 12. She handed the woman a business card with the unmistakable Channel 12 logo on it. The same unmistakable logo plastered on the side of the Jeep. Is this the home of Maria Ortiz? The missing girl? I'd like to help you find her. The short, round woman at the door looked her up and down. A man appeared behind her, slightly taller, maybe a bit older. They both looked weathered and tired and very much like Maria Ortiz. He put both hands on the woman's shoulders. The man nodded and stepped aside. Come in, por favor. The Ortizes had used every inch of the tiny space inside the trailer. The aroma of yellow rice and black beans wafted from the two-burner stovetop in the corner. Worn blankets draped neatly over vinyl chairs pushed together that might have been cast-offs from the waiting room of a walk-in clinic. A vase of artificial flowers rested atop the laminated table. In one quick glance, Jordan saw the place was tidy and clean, but the brown paneled walls and blinds made it too dark for good video without using the lights she'd left in her Jeep. But she didn't want to go back out now that she was inside. She'd have to shoot now and try to quickly adjust the camera's settings to maximize the available light. She held up her phone. May I record us on video? It might help. They nodded. She started rolling and asked the question again on camera to document their permission. I met Maria yesterday. 
She's a lovely girl. Jordan tried to put them at ease with light topics before she transitioned to her main questions. May I ask, what are you doing to help find Maria? We don't know what to do. Mrs. Ortiz appeared to have a better grasp on English than Mr. Ortiz, who largely remained silent. Police came here to tell us about Maria. We didn't know. They will help us. We can't afford to offer reward. Mr. Ortiz shook his head. He looked down and smoothed his wrinkled denim shirt. Jordan stopped the video, dropped her hands to her side, and raised her eyebrows. I'd like to try to report Maria's story on the news. It might help find her. May I take video of the outside of your house? She made the request simply to be polite. Jordan was allowed to shoot video from the public street out front. And if this story went live, other reporters would do exactly that. She wanted to be ahead of the pack. She'd grab the video before she left, just in case she needed it. Oh no no. The neighbors get mad, Mrs. Ortiz shook her forefinger. Mr. Ortiz gently placed his hand on his wife's shoulder again. Patricia had been right. The members of this community didn't want the media flocking here. But what community dealing with tragedy would want that? No problem. May I take pictures of Maria's bedroom? Yes, yes. Mrs. Ortiz stood and motioned for Jordan to follow. See. A key. Two steps away, they reached an open door not much thicker than a sturdy piece of cardboard. Beyond it was a bedroom too tiny for a 17-year-old girl. Jordan snapped pictures of pink walls, crowded with stuffed animals and drawings, showing a progression of childhood artwork to the more advanced doodling of a teenager. Then she flipped to video again and panned the room. Thank you. Jordan put away her camera. Can you tell me anything else? The name of her boss, perhaps? Mr. and Mrs. Ortiz looked at each other. He shrugged and shook his head. We do not know, Mrs. Ortiz said. She moved away to Tampa. Maria had already told Jordan she'd moved and she'd seemed homesick too. Many parents would never have allowed a 17-year-old girl to leave home like that. But in this community, children seemed to grow up faster. Parents hovered less and deferred to their children more. Especially the children who were born in the U.S. and spoke better English than their parents. Somehow, parents seemed to believe speaking English meant safety and maturity too. When did she move? Two weeks. Right, am I viejo? She looked at her husband and he nodded. For the job cleaning houses in Tampa. She dropped out of school? And she moved to be closer to the job? Mrs. Ortiz nodded. A girl offered to share apartment with rent for cheap. It made sense in the economics. Do you know the name of that girl? Edith Lena. Right, am I viejo? She turned and looked at Mr. Ortiz for agreement again. See. Si. Edith Lena. Now she had a last name for Edith, which was more than she had before. Do you have Edith's phone number? No. I'm sorry. How about an address? It would be the same as your daughter's, right? Mrs. Ortiz nodded quickly. Yes, yes. We sent Maria a package last week. She looked down and twisted her lips, then pretended to smooth her apron, but Jordan noticed her swipe a tear. Is there anywhere else Maria might have gone? Mrs. Ortiz shook her head. Does she have a boyfriend? Mrs. Ortiz's eyes widened and her mouth quivered. She shook her head again. One more thing, Mrs. Ortiz. Does Maria have a cell phone? In Jordan's world, every teenager had a cell phone. Finding Maria would be a lot easier if she had one. Clayton could track it, for one thing. Too expensive. Mrs. Ortiz shook her head. Three strikes. I get the address. She bustled another two steps to the kitchen and came back with a small notepad. Jordan took down the information. I'll see what I can find out, and I'll contact you if I learn anything. Okay? Mr. and Mrs. Ortiz nodded this time. Jordan offered to shake hands. Mr. Ortiz engulfed her hand in both of his and squeezed. Mrs. Ortiz hugged her, thanking Jordan over and over again. 
Jordan worried that she'd overpromised. What could she really do? She hurried back to the Jeep and snapped a few exterior still shots before she left. With luck and light traffic, she'd get back to the station before Patricia had a canary and Richard threw her out on her ear. Jordan fed Edith and Maria's address into the map application on her phone. Not exactly on the route back, but not too far out of the way either. You've already been gone too long. Are you trying to get fired? Of course, she wasn't. But Maria Ortiz and her family were not the kind of people who could do this on their own. If I don't help them, who will? Chapter 19 The Strawberry Cafe story would be quick. And she didn't need to package it. If they ran it at all, they'd run a short piece of video and soundbite. Yeah, she probably could get away with swinging by Edith and Maria's place and knocking on the door. Maybe Edith was home. She might talk to Jordan. Maybe. Nothing ventured, nothing gained, she said, just like her dad always told her. When she'd traveled 20 of the 25 minutes back to the station, Jordan called Patricia. Hey, just wanted to check in. I'm headed back, and I should be able to put the strawberry Vosot together for whenever. Do you know what show it's going in? Last I saw, it was the kicker at six. Of course that could change. The kicker was the last story of the newscast. The feel-good story that attempted to end the newscast on a lighter note. No problem. I'll be back shortly. Patricia's trademark grunt marked the end of the conversation. What a grump, Jordan said after she was sure Patricia had rung off. She wrinkled her nose and resisted the urge to stick her tongue out like a six-year-old. Jordan followed the driving directions on her phone app. She didn't want to store directions in the Jeep's GPS, where she might not have access to them later. She found the ramshackle apartment complex easily. She swung the Jeep left and parked out front. She dashed up the weather-beaten stairs to the second floor and turned left down the corridor to apartment number 209. A dark curtain behind the dirty window concealed the apartment's interior from view. Jordan knocked. Edith Lena's surly face peeked out from behind the curtain and then quickly backed away. Edith? It's me, Jordan. We met when you cleaned the Pierce house yesterday. Edith cracked open the door. Yes? Still surly. I heard Maria is missing, and if you can give me some more information, I think I can help. When she hesitated, Jordan said, I'm not leaving here until you talk to me. Edith opened the door only wide enough to slip through, and then closed it behind her. I didn't know her much. Past tense. Didn't know her. Jordan tried a more tender tone. You lived with her. You must have known her at least fairly well, didn't you? She didn't open up to me. Edith shrugged. I mean, you met her. You saw how standoffish she was. Not the word Jordan would have used to describe the shy Maria. Standoffish sounded more like Edith. Haughty and demanding, too. Jordan nodded to make Edith feel more comfortable. Her parents are very worried. I just thought, if you have any clue about where she might have gone. I don't know, before the police get involved. Edith's face paled. Maybe she hadn't realized how serious Maria's disappearance could be. But Jordan thought Edith had to know more than she claimed. Maria's parents said you invited her to live in this apartment. You must be worried too. Can I come in? Edith blocked the door with her body. Our roommates are sleeping. There were more roommates, but this apartment was small. Where did they all sleep? And why were they sleeping in the middle of the afternoon anyway? Oh, okay. Coaxing information out of Edith was like wrestling with an alligator. I was gonna ask how you met Maria. You know, trying to get an idea of the timeline so we can look for her. Because I understand she hasn't been living here very long. Not long at all. Couple weeks. Edith licked her lips and finally made meaningful eye contact. Jordan had done or said something that pushed a button. Felix asked me to find someone else to work at the cleaning. Said he'd give me a 10% raise. Felix who? 
My boss. Felix Marsh. You met him. Jordan nodded, filing away the last name in her head. One thing accomplished here, at least. So you knew Maria because? An after-school program where we're from. Not that good of friends in person. Edith's fidgeting settled down as she talked, but maybe she was giving Jordan a line of bull too. I saw online she was on some hard times. Her family needed money. She was asking for jobs, so I sent her a message. She was in, and I got the 10%. I see. Jordan nodded. A win-win. Yeah. Jordan tilted her head and frowned. I wonder where she possibly could have gone. You two left the Pierce house together, right? Edith nodded. Felix picked us up. He brought me back here. Maria had one more job. She works longer days. Edith stuck her chin out, defiance back in place. Last I saw Maria was when I got out of his van here. Aren't you worried about her? Jordan shook her head and continued to frown. I understand you weren't close friends but still. You lived together. You worked together. Girls come and go. Cleaning houses isn't a career or anything. She goes, I find someone else. Felix gives me another 10%. Edith shrugged. Nothing I can do. You should talk to Felix. Her gaze darted up and down the hallway, and she scratched the back of her neck. He pays our rent here. One of the perks. That wasn't what Maria said, was it? Didn't she say her rent was deducted from her pay? And Mrs. Ortiz said the rent was cheap, not free. Why would Felix be paying the rent? And why didn't Maria know that she didn't pay out of her check? All I know is Felix saw her after I did. But hey, if you find him, don't say that to him, okay? Don't mention me. A door in the distance slammed, echoing down the hallway, and when Edith's eyes widened, they were bloodshot. Jordan turned toward the noise and while her gaze was diverted, Edith slipped back into the apartment and closed the door. A deadbolt slid into place. On her way out, Jordan's phone rang and she reached into her sling bag to retrieve it. Her favorite reporter, Teresa Parma. Hey girl, Jordan grinned as if Teresa could see her. What's up? Do you have a death wish, or what? Teresa's tone was not joking. Get your ass back here. Right now. Patricia is on the warpath about you. But, her stomach felt like a colony of bees had swarmed into it. Now Jordan? Not later. Now. Teresa hung up. What the hell? Jordan stared at the phone for a second before she dropped it into her bag and hustled back to the jeep. Chapter 20 Jordan rushed toward the station as quickly as possible through late afternoon traffic. Job one was to get the Strawberry Cafe video uploaded and edited by 6 o'clock. She couldn't afford to be late. And then she'd find Teresa and figure out what was wrong with her. Teresa was Jordan's best friend at work. She'd never been anything but supportive. If Teresa was warning Jordan like that, something was seriously wrong. Jordan's phone rang again on the drive. It was Lillian, one of the producers. Crap. Producers usually only called for an information update request, a change of command, or if there was a problem. Jordan Fox here. Hey, we're cutting it close on time, and I just wanted to make sure you're on your way back, Lillian said. Translation, where the hell are you? Jordan's breath shortened as an uncomfortably hot wave rose from her chest to her hairline. Almost back. She whipped around the corner and pressed the gas pedal. You'll have that video, right? What video, what video? In the panic of Teresa's call, running late and getting in trouble again so soon after Richard's warning, Jordan's mind blanked on the actual assignment she'd been sent to do. It seemed so long ago now. Which it surely was. Lillian filled the silence. The strawberry cafe thing? Right. Yes. Strawberry cafe video comin' at ya. She hoped her voice sounded much calmer than she felt. If Patricia or even Richard had called, well, she didn't even want to think about that. Okay, because yeah. You should have been back half an hour ago to load it into the system. 
They wanted to use it at five, but they couldn't because you weren't back yet. Oh man. No wonder Teresa had called. Patricia must have been livid. Look, Lillian lowered her voice as if she didn't want to be overheard at the producer pod. I know you're new, and it's your first day back, so everyone gives you a little wiggle room, but you probably don't want to miss any opportunities to get your stuff on the air when given the chance. I mean, Drew Hodges never misses a chance. As you know. Boy, did she ever. And if she didn't pull this one out, she'd be toast for sure. Chapter 21 Jordan edited the Strawberry Cafe story for six and it turned out great. She hung around waiting for an updated assignment, but Patricia ignored her and nothing came her way. Which meant she had time to work on the Maria story. But first she owed Tom Clark a call. Since he'd been so nice to her. Yeah, right. Just admit you want to talk to the guy. Nothing wrong with that. Jordan. Like he couldn't contain his enthusiasm, which could only be a very good sign. She filled him in on her conversation with Edith. Just thought you'd want to know. Why isn't her family more active in the search? He sounded like he was standing in a cavernous room. The brewery, probably. They aren't very comfortable speaking English, and they don't know what else to do. I mean, they told the police. They talked to me. They said they pray about it. That's all they know to do. Jordan ran a hand through her hair. I've got a call in to Clayton, but he's not picking up. Maybe the police have made some progress, but I don't know. Tom grunted, then a little preoccupied, and why doesn't the station care about this story again? Well, she's 17. For all practical purposes, she's emancipated. She lives away from home and she's not in school and she has a job. Jordan repeated all the good arguments Patricia would make. A missing 17-year-old looks more like a runaway than an innocent little girl who was abducted. Especially since we don't have any evidence that she was taken, and even her family and co-workers aren't saying that. She could be a runaway, couldn't she? Or maybe she just took a day or two off. Went to downtown Disney? Somehow it didn't irritate Jordan as much as when Patricia said the same thing. Jordan blew a long stream of frustrated air toward the phone. Yes, it could be. I don't really know the girl. It just seems. I don't know. Tom grunted like he'd lifted something heavy. Aren't runaways at risk for human trafficking, though? Within the first 48 hours, runaways are at high risk for that. All right, so bottom line. We need to find Felix. Tom summed it up. She'd already planned to go to the LFC offices in the morning, but she didn't say that. Even if I could leave work right now, which I can't, but even if I could, he wouldn't be at the office at 7 o'clock on a Friday night. Right, hang on, Tom said to someone else. Jordan, I'm sorry. I'm right in the middle of brewing here, and I've got to get back to it before the beer is ruined. Can we talk later? Yeah. Of course. I should get back to work, too. She lingered, though. This is why your work schedule is perfect for me. Weekends are my busiest time, too. His comment warmed Jordan all the way to her toes. But Jordan. You left out one part. What's that? Be right there, he said, but not to her. I've really gotta go. Your safety tonight, though. I'm not trying to suggest you need a bodyguard, but in your shoes, I'd want one. Jordan threw her head back and closed her eyes. She was exhausted. Convincing her dad to sign the paperwork for Jenny Lane had used up about a week's worth of emotional energy. As much as she liked Tom Clark, she wasn't up for entertaining him after work again tonight. No worries. The police squad car will be here when I get off work. And I'm going straight home to bed. I'll be fine tonight. She put a smile into her voice. But I'm looking forward to Tuesday. My day off. Me too. Good night, Jordan Fox. He sounded sexy, like a late-night radio show host lonely women listen to after dark. Which was how Jordan knew she'd made the right choice. Because no way would she be able to resist him if he stayed overnight again. 
Jordan saw Teresa coming into the newsroom after her live shot, laden with her usual batch of shoulder bags. Jordan met Teresa at her desk. Thanks for the heads up, Jordan said. Teresa was the only one at Channel 12 who always had her back. Teresa pulled off her bags and plopped all but one of them on the floor. I've got to run to the bathroom. Walk with me. Teresa moved like a whirlwind all the time. They passed Patricia at the assignment desk, but she seemed not to notice. Tell me about your missing girl story, Teresa said without looking at Jordan. That's where you were, right? Maybe I can help so you don't end up flipping burgers at Tom Clark's brewery. Had Tom called Teresa? They were friends, and he was worried about Jordan. So he probably did. Which annoyed Jordan and pleased her at the same time. You heard my pitch at the meeting, right? I did. And straight up, Jordan? Patricia was right. Jordan felt her spine stiffen, but Teresa didn't let up. Look, you've got to act like a professional. When you don't have a good pitch, you've got to know that. When someone points out the problems, you should be grateful. You don't want to waste your time on stories that will never be aired, do you? You're right, but... No buts, Jordan. They'd reached the bathroom, and Teresa had checked to be sure no one else was there. She ran her hands through her long caramel hair and held it at the back of her head, elbows out, while she wrapped an elastic around her ponytail. Look, you've got more talent in your little toe than Drew Hodges has in his whole body. Jordan felt sheepish warmth flood through her. But if you ever want to get what you deserve around here, you've got to work on your timing, girl. Jordan gave Teresa a quick hug. They were friends again. So tell me about your missing girl. Skip the parts one already know. Chapter 22 Jordan talked while Teresa gooped some white stuff onto her face and wiped it around to remove the garish HD-friendly makeup. Then she splashed her face with water and pulled out her bag full of normal makeup. By the time Teresa looked like her off-camera self, she'd heard the whole story. Or at least as much of it as Jordan knew. The tale didn't take very long. Let's get a coffee. Teresa turned and dashed toward the break room, with Jordan following like the white contrail behind a Boeing 747. Okay. Recap. Jordan grinned. Teresa talked like a list of bullet points sometimes. Girl shows up at Linda Pierce's house. She's incompetent. And pretty. She's also young, shy, and eager to please. Add to that, she's poor and bruised in a way that suggests she's been physically restrained against her will. Then she disappears. Roommate, parents, and employer have no idea where she is. That about sum it up. Pretty much. Teresa arched her eyebrows. What else? Facts, I mean. Not bad juju vibes, or whatever you call it. My news knows, Jordan grinned and shrugged. She felt there had to be more. But she couldn't actually prove anything else. Maria wouldn't just run off with nowhere to go and not tell anyone. She doesn't own a car or even have a driver's license. I checked. How would she go anywhere? Good point. Teresa nodded. It's not like we have great public transportation around here. She seemed to be thinking about everything for a while as she sipped coffee hot enough to scald her tongue. Clayton Vaughn, the Tampa cop I told you about? He says we've got a serious human trafficking problem. Teresa nodded again. Huge. I've done countless stories on it. The port is a good place for bringing people in and out of Tampa without getting caught. But that's not the only place these slime bags find slave labor. Farming communities like the one your girl came from are another source. Runaways. Internet sites. Casinos. All those adult entertainment spots are hunting ground, too. Jordan's quick research had turned up a more hopeful option. But what about safe houses? Could she have been rescued and taken to one of those? Maybe. But if that's what happened, we won't find her. They'll relocate her. It's a little bit like witness protection. She'll disappear forever. Teresa must have noticed Jordan's frown. So the question is, how do we find your tragic little rabbit before it's too late? Jordan's heart pounded hard against her sternum. 
She sat up straight and stared at Teresa as if she'd instantly grown another head. What did you say? Teresa cocked her head. Which part? About finding my tragic rabbit? Chill. I just meant her life sucks, right? And she's a runner, one way or another. Teresa's puzzled expression lingered. Why? But where did you hear that expression? You mean tragic rabbit? It's common slang. Like poor little lamb or lost soul. Why? Not that common. I've only heard tragic rabbit recently. Well, it's common where I come from. Which is where exactly? You're being a little weird about this, aren't you? Teresa shrugged. My ancestors went from Mexico to Cuba. Grandparents migrated from Cuba and my parents were born in Miami before my grandparents moved here. Me, I'm a native Tampa girl just like you. Let me guess. Your family lived in Centro Tampa? When I was a kid, they did. I grew up there. It was a great place for kids back then. Not so much now. Teresa finished her coffee. Can we get back to your missing girl? Just one more thing. You know that Lost Soul is a Polish death metal band, right? My ex used to listen to their music. I didn't know that. Death metal is so 1990. Not my thing. Teresa grinned. Lost Soul is also a flying demon in Doom 3, which is one of my nephew's favorite video games. Nasty Demon 2. Jordan pulled her phone out of her pocket and did a quick internet search for a lost soul. Dozens of hits. Everything from poems to books to clothes and games and well lots of other things. Her fingers trembled when she changed the search to Tragic Rabbit and hit the search button. Again, dozens of hits and similar variety. Poems, music, artists, even a couple of specialty shops. Earth to Jordan, Teresa knocked on the table. Anybody home? Startled, Jordan looked up. Oh. Sorry. It's just. Well. Never mind. All of a sudden, Jordan felt exhausted. She hadn't realized how much she'd been relying on the connection between El Pulpo and Tragic Rabbit to solve her mother's murder. Now that she knew how common Tragic Rabbit was, a sense of helplessness washed over her once more. Okay. So back to business then? Teresa tapped her fingers on the table, impatiently. Yes. How do we find Maria? She doesn't have a cell phone, I asked her parents. So we can't trace her through cell tower pings or anything like a Find Me app. Microchip? What? Like a dog tracker or something? Kind of. I mean, there are microchips like that for humans. But there's microchips in everything these days. To thwart thieves mostly. Credit cards and hotel keys and things like that. I don't know if Maria would have anything like that, but it's worth a try. And even if she doesn't, maybe that disgusting Felix Marsh does. He probably has a traceable cell phone too. Jordan was already scrolling through her phone. Let's see if we can find Keith Simpson. Teresa grinned. He's so geeky it's adorable. Agreed. Keith picked up on the first ring. Jordan Fox here. I know, I see you. Jordan blinked. She looked for drones or cameras or other watching devices around the room. You can see me? Right now. You betcha. How? I'm walking into the break room right now. Chapter 23 Teresa started laughing, and Jordan whipped around to see Keith standing at the coffee pot. He waved. She scowled, disconnected, and waved him over. Ha! 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 You're so much fun to tease, Jay Fox. Keith raised his coffee cup as if it was a champagne flute. I couldn't resist. How may I be of service? What do you know about microchips? Everything. He wiggled his eyebrows like Groucho Marx. Why? We need to find a guy. Felix Marsh. He's employed by Lemony Fresh Cleaners over on the north edge of downtown Tampa. We think he's kidnapped a young girl named Maria Ortiz. Jordan squared her shoulders. My informed hunch is that he may have her involved in human trafficking. Can you help? 
The easiest way to find him is through his cell phone, if he has one. People tend to keep cell phones on their bodies. Keith turned the chair around and straddled it, folding his arms to rest on the chair back. Second easiest thing is to use the fly, once we figure out where he lives or where his car is or something like that. The fly was Keith's multi-rotor or drone as most people called them. He and Jordan had used the fly to track a high-speed police chase and get great video for TV in the process. The fly was super cool but could it find Felix and through him, Maria? Teresa asked, if that doesn't work maybe we can use microchips? Some of these human trafficking organizations use microchips on their workers. But if not, they should also have microchips embedded in credit cards, bank cards, all sorts of things they've got in their wallets, right? Keith nodded slowly. That will take a little longer, but it's doable. Possibly. Let's divide up the work and get started. Jordan's energy had renewed with the promise of potential success, finally. Maybe we can find Maria tonight. We need to hurry. Why? Teresa cocked her head again. I mean, other than the obvious that sooner is better? Because Maria said Felix wanted to put her to work on the cruise ships, Jordan replied. And cruise ships leave port around here on Saturday. Tomorrow. Teresa nodded her understanding. Got it. Which means we don't have a lot of time, folks. Keith stood and lifted his leg over the seat of the chair and returned it to normal position. I'll take the record search. Maybe Felix has rented or purchased a place to live. I'll look for bank accounts and car titles, too. Teresa headed to her desk. Wait. Teresa turned back to look at Jordan from the doorway. He was driving a white van when he showed up at the Pierce house yesterday. I might have a license plate number on the photos I shot. Or at least the van's make and model. I'll send them to your phone and you'll have them before you get back to your desk. That will help. Teresa waved and kept going. Send those photos to me too, Keith said. If I find Felix Marsh, I'll have a way to match him up. I'll pull the cell phones. See if I can find one that works for our purposes. Let's meet in Keith's office in an hour. Jordan headed outside for privacy to call Clayton. She'd get an update on police efforts. And she had another idea, too. Because she'd vowed never again to forget that everything in Tampa was connected, she'd ask about whether El Pulpo was involved in human trafficking. And whether they used microchips on their workers. If he didn't know, Agent Ricer would. Clayton's phone rang three times before he picked up. You're still at work, right? Most people say hello when they answer the phone, Jordan said. So that's a yes. What's up? I'm hoping you found something on the missing girl, Maria Ortiz. Any luck? Not yet. We interviewed the parents early this morning. We persuaded them to sign the missing person report. We circulated that. We followed up with her employer. He sounded a bit exasperated. But so far, no real leads. You talked to Felix Marsh? What did he say? Felix who? No, we talked to the president at Lemony Fresh Cleaning. A woman. She said Maria was new, been with them only a couple of weeks. She didn't show up for work after she left the Pierce house. That's all they knew. What about her employment records? Did you get those? Nothing helpful there. Her residence address is an apartment she shares with five other girls, all of them working at one domestic job or another. None have two nickels to rub together. No car, no driver's license, no credit cards, no cell phone. So how did she get away? That apartment isn't exactly on the bus line. And I doubt she would have had cash for a taxi. Someone had to drive her somewhere. Jordan took a deep breath. Did you talk to Edith Lena? The roommate who recruited Maria? Now there's an interesting story. How so? Edith is quite the little entrepreneur. She's responsible for recruiting at least a dozen other girls for LFC. And she's got a driver's license as well as a car. Did you go inside that apartment? Make sure Maria wasn't there? We asked for permission to enter. 
Edith's name is on the lease and she said no. We can't just go busting down doors. And we don't have enough evidence to get a search warrant. Yet. So you're working on it though? Jordan Fox isn't the only person in the world with brains in her head. Of course. Sorry. I'm just worried that's all. If you worried as much about your own safety as you do these pet cases of yours, we'd all be a lot better off. Did she have a sign on her back that said, kick me, I'm down today or what? One more thing. Do you know if El Pulpo is involved in human trafficking? Why? Something a friend said to me. About how everything I've been working on seems to be connected to El Pulpo. It's a worldwide crime cartel, Jordan. If it's criminal and they can make money, they do it. El Pulpo means octopus. Many arms. They reach out in every direction. Do they microchip their workers? I don't know. Maybe. There would be both good and bad consequences to that practice. They could easily find their workers. What's the bad part? Chapter 24 When we find one of their victims and take the chip out, it'd be pretty damning evidence, wouldn't it? Indeed it would. Talk about evidence of a strong connection to El Pulpo. A microchip under the skin might be the best possible thing. Maybe we should examine Edith Lena. Good luck getting a warrant for that. What about Evan Groves and Hugo Diaz? Maybe we could get the warrant, but it'll take a while. They've got that shark lawyer. He's not gonna just roll over because Jordan Fox wants something. What about Pippo Sanchez? He died in his jail cell. Surely there's an autopsy, right? Wouldn't the chip have been found? I'll ask. But Jordan, I have a regular job. And I've got to get back to it. Please go back inside your building and stay there until your shift is over. I really don't want to be searching for you again before the night is over. She called Agent Ricer next. Again, the call kicked over to voicemail. Where was she? On assignment, probably. But her big case right now was El Pulpo which meant Agent Ricer was tied up with something important that Jordan needed to know. The longer Agent Ricer was unavailable, the more nervous Jordan became. Wait. She could find Agent Ricer right now. And she knew exactly how to do it. Jordan slipped her phone into her pocket and hurried to Keith Simpson's office. He leaned close to one of his computer screens while another screen showed a long search in progress. Any luck? I've located three possible cell phones for Felix Marsh so far. He didn't look up. Jordan pulled up Agent Ricer's number on her phone and held it out to Keith. Try this one. Okay. He typed it into his search engine. Jordan looked around at the various screens running all sorts of fast data. Is this stuff legal? Patricia would have a cow if they did anything illegal tonight. Of course. He shrugged. Mostly. A loud ping rang out from the screen on Keith's left. He glanced at it. That's your number. Looks like it's at the port or the casino. No, wait. It's across the street from the port. That new condo complex, the Grove. Do you know it? Jordan nodded. Yeah. I know it. Wonder what she's doing there? I thought you said Maria didn't have a cell phone? FBI agent Ricer. She's working on the El Pulpo case. Why would she be down there? Call her. Find out. I've tried. She doesn't answer. Jordan looked at the map on the screen. She changed to satellite view and zoomed out. Agent Ricer's phone was in the parking lot at the Grove. Sitting there. Not moving. That's interesting, Keith said. One of the Felix Marsh cell phones is pinging off the same tower. Take a look. Keith pointed to a red dot in one of the condo buildings at the Grove, almost directly across from Agent Ricer's phone. Teresa barreled into the small office, talking as she walked. I found the van and an address for Felix Marsh. It's at the Grove. You know where that is? Right across from the cruise ship docks. I think you're right, Jordan. 
Felix probably has Maria ready to board a cruise ship tonight or tomorrow morning. Jordan didn't hesitate. Let's go down there. Something is definitely going on. We may not find Maria, but there's a story of some kind going on. Sure. Why not? Teresa grinned. Let me get my equipment. If Jordan had tried to go on this story alone, Patricia would have stopped her for sure. But shadowing Teresa, she was golden. I'll get keys to a jeep and meet you both in the front lobby, Jordan said. Bring the fly, Keith. We may not be able to get close enough on our own. You got it, Heath replied. Life with Jay Fox is never boring. Ten minutes later, they were almost there. The casino and the port were only a few blocks away. She wasn't sure if she was more intrigued to find out what Felix was up to, nervous about what they might find, or excited to be on a hot lead with Teresa and Keith again. Was this the best job in the world or what? Jordan turned the jeep into the parking lot at the Grove. Anybody see anything that looks like an FBI vehicle? Can't we pinpoint Agent Ricer's cell phone, Keith? Teresa asked. Pull over into a corner of the parking lot, Jordan. The fly can do the rest of our looking around, Keith replied. Jordan found a spot that left all the doors of the jeep free. She flipped the ignition off and turned in her seat. Did you get a unit number on Felix's address? 531, Teresa said. So that's gonna be on the fifth floor. I pulled up the real estate webcams and building maps. That unit is on this side of the building. She leaned to look out the windshield and pointed. See that one with the light on and the balcony open? That's it. Okay, Jordan said. We know what we're looking for. Is the fly ready? The fly was a quadcopter, not much larger than a frisbee. Keith had built it himself, so it was pretty awesome. Painted a glow-in-the-dark shade of green with two indigo eyes made it resemble a housefly. The eyes were three-dimensional and convex because they contained video cameras. Keith said it was the best drone he could make without being in the military. Teresa asked, how does it work? This is the transmitter. It's got a screen on it because of the fly's cameras. So we can see whatever the fly can see. It records video, too. Yep. Come on. Let's get out and I'll show you. Jordan said, Keith, can the fly give us a look inside Felix's condo through the window? Maybe we can get a glimpse of Maria, if she's in there. Sure, and maybe one step better. I can send the fly inside the condo through that open glass door, if we can't see her from outside. Ah oh, guys, Teresa said, that's more than a little illegal. We can't send an intruder into Felix's home, even if he's a creep, and the intruder is a machine. So let's send the fly up there and maybe Felix will come out to see what's outside. Jordan suggested. The fly makes a loud buzzing noise. He should notice it. Keith sent the fly directly to the open door on the fifth floor and looked inside. The camera captured a well-furnished contemporary kitchen. Felix and Maria were seated at the table. Maria was handcuffed. She had a black eye. Bruises on her face. Her hair was snarled. She wore a white tank top smeared with grime. Felix was shoveling food in his face and watching television. That's her. That's Maria. Jordan pulled out her phone and dialed 911. They could get here in less than six minutes, faster than she could explain to Clayton. Yes, this is an emergency. A crime in progress. There's a missing girl named Maria Ortiz and I know where she is, and she's in trouble. Jordan gave the dispatcher the address and apartment number. Teresa had jogged to the jeep to pull out the equipment they'd need to shoot the story for the station. Jordan hung up with the 911 dispatcher. Should I call Patricia? Have her send a crew. We are a crew, aren't we? They'll hear it on the scanner and send someone with a truck. We'll already have the early stuff before then. Teresa handed Jordan the mic. I'll shoot you talk. But I'm a mess. I can't go on camera looking like this. I'm already rolling. Say something we can use. Like where we are. Chapter 25
Jordan straightened her posture and raised the mic. Channel 12 is following a developing story at the Grove in Tampa tonight where a missing girl has been found in a luxury condo after a 36-hour ordeal that began yesterday afternoon. Teresa was barely rolling when all hell broke loose. Four black FBI SUVs zoomed in from nowhere and screeched to a halt, blocking the parking lot entrances. What the hell? Jordan whipped her head around to see. Teresa kept rolling. Keith held the fly outside Felix's open door. An FBI van sped from a further distance and pulled up behind the SUVs. While armed agents poured out with guns at the ready, two helicopters approached and held floodlights on the entire area. Hey! Be careful! Keith yelled. He brought the fly back to the jeep and fussed over it like a cat with her kittens. Across the parking lot, Agent Reiser and her partner, Special Agent Lincoln Hunt, hopped out of another SUV. They were fully armed and armored. The armed agents, including Reiser and Hunt, rushed into the Grove's attached parking garage. Jordan saw them running up the open stairs. Teresa kept rolling. Jordan, say something. Jordan blinked. Right. She was still on video. This was her chance. But what should she say? She had no idea what was going on. This was way too much firepower for one missing girl. Not to mention the FBI arrived way too fast after her 911 call. She began by simply telling the viewers what she saw. FBI agents have arrived at the Grove. In less than three minutes, two Tampa PD cruisers pulled into the parking lot with blue lights flashing and sirens going. They screeched to a stop and four officers ran into the building. Tampa police are now also on the scene, Jordan continued to report and Teresa continued to roll as official vehicles from several local agencies arrived to surround the entire complex. The video and her reports would be uploaded to Channel 12 servers. She had to trust that whoever edited it for air would edit out the parts that made her look the most stupid. Twenty minutes later, when the Channel 12 live truck pulled up, the morning photographer hopped out of the driver's seat. And out of the passenger seat popped Drew Hodges. Drew yelled to Jordan. Hey, where's your friend Clayton? She raised her palms in the air and shrugged. Then she heard a voice across the way. Jordan. Clayton jogged over to the jeep. The first thing that popped into Jordan's mind was the fear that Clayton would try to get too friendly with her. But that was nonsense, surely he wouldn't flirt with her around his co-workers. He was there for work. Which meant he was in uniform. Which is not important. Just a costume. She had way more important things to be thinking about right now anyway. Jordan stopped speaking and walked off camera while Teresa continued to roll. She waved Clayton to the side. What's going on here? You don't know? Clayton frowned. I thought that's why you called 911. I called because we found Maria. I haven't been able to reach Reiser for two days. Jordan shook her head. Tell me. Quick. Your guy Felix is a human trafficking scumbag. He's been operating out of LFC for a few weeks. We're not sure what the connection is there. Jordan made a circular gesture with her hand that he should speed up to the essential parts right now. The rest could come later. He scowled. The FBI has been staked out here for two days. This is apparently a staging area where they hold the girls before they move them onto the cruise ships later tonight. There's about 30 inside the building. Drew had pulled his phone from his pocket and started taking notes. Oh sorry man, Clayton said. I should have prefaced by saying this is off the record. Oh. Drew put his phone away. Right on. I was listening to my buddies radioing on the way over here. Clayton shoved his hands in his pockets. They've separated them. Felix and Maria. They're both being interrogated. And the other girls? What about them? They're in the process of securing them all. They'll try to get Maria to tell them as much as she can about Felix before they bring any victims down into the middle of the media circus. Clayton glanced over his shoulder. I've gotta go. But this is going to be a long night. 
We won't be done here before morning. You'd better get more backup. Drew gestured across the parking lot. Looks like media's showing up and gathering over there. I'm gonna join in. He jogged off to a spot where it appeared officers would be bringing Maria and Felix out of the building. Eventually. Jordan was still nervous. Agent Reiser and Agent Hunt might be furious about all of this, and Jordan would have to deal with the consequences. She had seriously messed up their sting with that 911 call, but she'd tried to call Agent Reiser several times. Maybe that would count for something. And she'd saved Maria from becoming another tragic rabbit, as Teresa had called her. Which was what she'd wanted to do. Teresa was still shooting video, and Keith stood watching the scene unfold with his own two eyes. Like Clayton said, this was going to be a long night. Jordan picked up the mic again and continued shooting her stand-up report. But she wasn't officially assigned to this story. Drew was. Would they even use her material? At least El Pulpo couldn't touch her while she was reporting here all night. Jordan Fox's story continues in. Hard News, A Jordan Fox Mystery. Click here to read now. The Jordan Fox Mysteries. Cold Open, Book 1. Two Shot, Book 2. Jump Cut, Book 3. Beat Check, Book 4. Down Cut, Book 5. Sound Bit, Book 6. Hot Roll, Book 7. Hard News, Book 8. Sign Off, Book 9. For new release notifications, free offers, and general information for members only, please sign up for our Diane Capri mailing list. We don't want to leave you out. Click here to join Diane Capri's mailing list. Have you read all of Diane Capri's books? Maybe it's time to give them a try. Click here for a complete list of Diane Capri books. About the author. Diane Capri is a New York Times USA Today and worldwide best-selling author. She's a recovering lawyer and snowbird who divides her time between Florida and Michigan. An active member of Mystery Writers of America, Authors Guild, International Thriller Writers, Alliance of Independent Authors, and Sisters in Crime, she loves to hear from readers and is hard at work on her next novel. Please connect with Diane online www.diancapri.com Twitter, at Diane Capri Facebook, facebook.com slash diane.capri1 facebook.com slash dianecapribooks